Hello everyone, this is Lala, and today I am going to do the Game Player Tier Ranking for the Big Brother Canada Alumni. So, of course, I am not going to cover Big Brother Canada 8, and I didn't cover them because their season ended way too prematurely, and I did not include Amal from Big Brother Canada 11. Since they edited her out of the few episodes she was on, she wasn't on the digital dailies, and we really have no information. But everyone else from Big Brother Canada 1 to Big Brother Canada 11 is fair game. I ranked all of the casts of each season in their own game player tier rankings. So Big Brother Canada 1 game player tier ranking, 2, 3, all the way down to 11. And if I remember correctly, I also ranked the alumni based on their position in the game. So I ranked all the pre-jurors, I ranked all the jurors that went home before the final six, and then I ranked all the end gamers, so from the winners to the six placers, so you can check those out as well. I am going to say, since I did those lists and my initial list of how I ranked the entire Big Brother Canada cast at around May, which is when I finished watching BB Can 11. It's been many months since then. It's been actually like 11 months. So I might have changed some positions here and there. So if it doesn't make sense based on how I ranked previous videos, that is why because I did some last minute changes. So with that in mind, I'm going to use the seven tiers that I've used throughout all of my videos like this. So abysmal, bad, potential, mediocre, Solid, good, and great. Let's just get right to it. Obviously, the abysmal tier is the worst of the worst. These are people who made the worst game moves possible, didn't last long whatsoever, and their downfall was heavily their fault, and I don't foresee them doing well on any season, just based on the skills they showed here. So, that is what this tier is. So, the first group of people are what I like to call abysmal self-destructive, disasters, where there's pretty much just no hope from them, based on what I saw here. So, at dead last, at 147th, is Danielle from Big Brother Canada 1. So, she was on the outs the entire time she was on, with the entire house, with the exception of Gary and somewhat Suzette from the very beginning. She had a turbulent relationship with Jillian over Emmett, volunteered to go on the block, thinking that it would gain her trust. Jillian was planning on targeting her anyways, but was initially swayed by Emmett. Did no campaigning to save herself, alienated herself from the house even more, and was blindsided out of the house. She didn't care to play the game whatsoever, was more focused on fame and romances, had poor social, strategic skills, and I just don't see her doing well on any season, due to all the reasons I've stated. At 1.46 is Josh from Big Brother Canada 9. He was on the outs from the very beginning, but had paranoid meltdowns a few days in the season, which diverted people away from him even more. He was supposed to be the first boots due to his behavior, but was spared due to reasons not in his control. He had poor reads on the house, claiming that there's an all-boy alliance when all the boys were targeting one another. He thought that he was closer to more people than he actually was, when most of the house just called him delusional and were blatantly making fun of him. He was obsessed with causing chaos and was seen as an easy move for people. Has a poor social game and is very interpersonal, while having poor strategic reads and poor competition skills. Don't seem doing well for all the reasons mentioned above, and also being very paranoid. At 145th is Suzette from Big Brother Canada 1. So she was on the out from the very beginning, and that never changed throughout her time in the house. Was lucky to win the first HOH based off a phone call, but targeted someone who was not coming after her, in Cat and didn't use her HOH to form strategic or personal bonds with people to be protected. Initially targeted Tom and Emmett without having the support to do so as well. Was a dead woman walking in week 3, but was spared by a twist no one in the house knew about with the Canada's veto. Had several meltdowns and ranted about how people getting into showmans, people were rednecks, and people were being cows, essentially. Gained an extra two weeks due to a twist and Gary winning HOH, but remained on the bottom of the house. Was sent home before jury solely because the house didn't want her in jury and just wanted an easy week. House felt like she gave pity parties to people for support and for game, which rubbed people the wrong way, but it wasn't even true. It was just her personality. She's not good at comps, poor socially, and struggles to get along with people in the house who are going to be younger than her in any cast. Don't see her doing well in any season. 
At 144th is Mackie from Big Brother Canada 7. He should be higher because he went home on a split vote. Was not the majority, or he wasn't in the majority the first week, but wasn't in the minority either. Was supposed to be an easy pawn, but actively did work that made him the target. Told people in the house, not only the age of age, but in the vote, that he was coming for them, didn't campaign whatsoever to save himself, and had no understanding of strategy and didn't care to have one an understanding either. Had to be consistently trained by other people on what to say and do, and couldn't even do that successfully. Got a tie vote due to none of his own doing, but due to others using him. He would be higher, but actively did work to ruin his spot. If I remember correctly, he several times told Anthony and Dane that he would nominate and come after them, where he didn't even get the concept of just lying. And doesn't seem to have the awareness or ability to improve from his mistakes. He was good in competitions, but his abysmal strategy completely ruined his other strengths. And the ability to just understand the sheer basics of Big Brother overall. At 143rd is Levita from Big Brother Canada 4. I did feel bad for how people treated her in the season, but overall, she's just a really abysmal player. She wins the first H O H, and people offer themselves to work with her, mainly Jared, and then puts up his romance Kelsey in the first week, without even putting him up, so it's you either nominate both or nominate neither. She isolated herself the entire week with Shari and ended up being blindsided with the vote. Ends up on the block in the second week due to these poor social bonds and Jared winning HOH. Stay speaks of nothing she ended up doing and she wins HOH again. You would think she uses this to make amends with the house, strengthen some bonds, and learn from her horrible HOH. Nope! She yet again targets someone who wasn't targeting her, yet again isolates herself from most of the house, and yet again nominates a poor pawn, and yet again gets blindsided by the votes. She caught flack for an HH that wasn't even hers, and was too much of a game bot for her supposed allies, which caused Mandy to prematurely send her home. In addition to that, no one voted her back in the house. We see here that she just repeats the same mistakes over and over again, and I can see her doing that in other seasons. The final person in the self-destructive disaster sub-tier is Paul at 142nd from Big Brother Canada 2. I don't feel like he truly got the strategies that are needed to do well in Big Brother in general. He came in with a plan to be a pot-stirring villain, but that's a tough strategy on its own, but it's even tougher to pull off as an older house guest and when you lack the charm to do so. He ends up winning the first HOH, but misused it horribly as he was caught making several alliances and the only thing he had by the end of the week were two allies with weak games. Easily got himself on the outs, especially after calling Andrew racist for supposed strategy reasons. Ended up staying due to nothing of his own doing, and became a pawn for Ica, when he was a horrible pawn due to most of the house not liking him, and there's no cow to keep him on the block safe against. Even the people who are pawning him, i.e. the girls, didn't have much intention on working with him. He had no regrets for how he played the game, and would probably play it again, so in addition to all of that, he probably doesn't do well on most seasons, and justifies my ranking him in this spot. So the next sub-tier of abysmal players are for people who I feel like were passive, or were general outclasts, who have no chance in Big Brother. So the first person in this sub-tier is Risha from Big Brother Canada 3 at 141st. In some ways, she was definitely twist screwed since there was no HOH like most first weeks, and she might have been kept safe depending on who won HOH, and she was also voted out by Canada instead of the house guests. At the same time, she ended up being nominated because she made a four poor first impression on the house guests and continued to not make a good impression. She found it hard to fit in with the cast and was seen as too big of a personality for them. Apparently she made comments about royal sexuality that also rubbed people the wrong way and was going to be voted out by the house anyways if it was a normal vote. I don't see her doing well on virtually any season, though she isn't as strategically messy as some of the others from the little that we do see of her. At 140th is Melina from Big Brother Canada 10. We are going to have a string of first boots getting the boots here on this list. She was initially seen as the pawn, but a pawn that no one cared about booting first, and this mainly happened because she didn't speak to many people. We see her struggling to bond with people and was too intrapersonal to do well in the game. Also gamed with the other nominee and continued doing so knowing that it wasn't a good move. Just don't have any faith in her as a player and see her doing poorly on most seasons.
At 139th is Laura from Big Brother Canada 7. Another first boot on the list, and one of the more forgettable first boots in my opinion, just based on the fact that her season was a male dominant one, meant that she already wasn't going to do very well, and the chances of that were low. I don't recall her having any sort of allies, but she was hyper focused on Samantha, who was in a showman with the HOH, and eventually Adam as well, which did her absolutely no favors. She admits that she cannot be fake in the house, and when something bothers her, she will vocalize it and let it be known, which are fundamental flaws. The season was weird though, since there is no power of veto, so maybe she would have had a chance to save herself if there was a veto. I don't see her being as dead in the water on most seasons as some of the other first boots and other players in general below her, hence her being here, but I don't feel confident about her in general. It was reported that she had a metaphorical hard on for Adam and Samantha and was very vocal about it to the house, which was dumb since they're in power, so that's not a good trait for her either. 138 goes to Enik from Big Brother Canada 2. She was clearly cast to be an extremely quirky woman on her season, and it made her stand out in a negative way. It seemed like she didn't think or care much for the game, and she was mainly targeted due to her personality. It did not seem like she had any ally, so I see her doing poorly on most seasons. In general, she stood out like a sore thumb, and she couldn't tone it down even if she wanted to. There really isn't much to say about her, though she might have been the intended pawn for Paul when he made his initial nominations. 137th is Rosina from Big Brother Canada 6. Another standard first boot who stood out like a sore thumb amongst the cast they were in, but unlike many of the others, she was affected by twists, since there was the heaven and hell twist that made half of the house safe, whoever was on the losing team had the option to be HOH, and there were only a few other people eligible to be nominated. It seemed like she just mentioned Big Moose and also rubbed Johnny the wrong way with how blatantly she was against him in the HOH comp, so she didn't do herself any favors there. It seemed like the house guests actually liked her, which isn't usually the case for most first boots, but let's be real, she doesn't do well on most if any season she's on, so I have nowhere else but here to put her. 136 is Christine from Big Brother Canada 4. With a season that had three sides of the house, and one of those sides being the self-declared floaters, Christine should have been in a prime position to do well. She mentioned that she actively took a step back and didn't play the game, which would be fine if she formed some solid relationships and especially got with the floaters, but that didn't happen. People in the house saw her as dry and miserable, in addition to seeing her as expendable, so it's not shocking when she was blindsided out of the house when Levita made her a poor pawn. Outside of being an older person, her attitude and passivity won't cause her to do well on most seasons. So the final person in this outsider sept here is Vanessa from Big Brother Canada 11. She was never formally evicted and was pulled from the game, so we can give Vanessa that at least. In general, she had no alliances in the house, was consistently etched out of strategy talks, the girls didn't include her in their game talk or allegiances, and many of the guys wanted to actively talk at her. She got very emotional and paranoid, which caused her to go after Zach and poorly lied about her vote, which everyone knew about. At least she could have stayed a bit longer if she wasn't pulled from the game, but Vanessa isn't doing well on most BB seasons, was all over the place strategically and poor socially, and sticks out like a sure sore thumb too much. So the final sub tier for the abysmal tier is what I like to call the lack of or poor choices in allies. And the first person in this sub tier, 134th, is Veronica from BB Ken 6. So she had the benefit of coming in after the first week and given immunity in the second week. Robbed people the wrong way just due to her sketchiness, her stories did not add up and came off as very untrustworthy to many people in the house. Her strategies were poor and made no sense, like the hinky vote she threw and then blatantly lying about it to the point that no one believed it, getting HOH items on an HOH that wasn't even hers, and her need for the house meetings and getting involved in stuff that has nothing to do with it is just a really poor trait. At least she had a few allies on her side, unlike many of the people below her, and while she's not dead in the water on most seasons, her irrational and nonsensicalness doesn't do her well on most seasons. At 133rd is Stephanie from Big Brother Canada 10. She seemingly knew what to do pertaining to the game, at least in the preseason, but it just didn't add up. She entered the game wanting to flirt with and manipulate some of the guys, but everyone saw through what she was doing. She didn't have the tact or social grace to pull it off. Apparently, she isolated herself with Jason in the first week. A lot of the girls didn't care for her, and she was not included in the majority alliance, and the guys weren't biting either. Apparently, a lot of people wanted to target her entering the second week, and the only reason why Marty didn't target her that week was because of a deal they made. 
And of course, she was nominated by an ally on her final week in the house where he didn't even intend for her to go home. And because of his stupid actions and putting up an even more worthier pawn and ally to people, they ended up flipping the house on her. If I remember correctly, Gino never cared for her, despite him supposedly being an ally, and even JC Lynn was more than willing to throw her to the wolves, but she was told that she was staying. In general, I think Stephanie's just a bit too messy and awkward to last long, almost. Seasons. 132nd is Shari from Big Brother Canada 4. I know that she didn't play a good game, clearly, but before I rewatched BB Can, I wasn't expecting her to be in the lowest tier. The main issue I have with her game is that she really isolated herself with Levita in the first week and got very comfortable once Levita won HOH, but it wasn't her HOH. She tied herself to the biggest target in the house and didn't even have solid eyes on her side, where they would have much interest in keeping her or getting to know many of the other house guests in general. When she and Levita were on the outs, they had a very poor conversation with Kelsey, and she essentially lay down and died once she was on the block. People saw her as someone who had a lot of potential, but she made a lot of poor moves in the two weeks she was in the house, and I don't really see her improving in other environments or seasons. At 131st, we have our first juror, and that is Dan from Big Brother Canada 11. And we're going to see a few more jurors as we close up the abysmal tier. He really had no alliances throughout the entirety of the season, but him being the last person to speak to the HOH and being expendable to everyone caused him to be put on the block in the first week, and people started talking about him more and more when he almost won that veto. Luckily, there's already a plan to boot John Michael, but he was the biggest target entering week 2, but he luckily won HOH. You would think that he would use this to strengthen his relationships with the house guests on a personal and strategic level, right? Nope! He does everything Zach tells him to do or says without even questioning anything about it or speaking to others about it, and it made him look like a Zach minion when Zach was losing a lot of power in the season. He targeted someone who wasn't targeting him and was someone he promised to keep safe before Zach got to him, and he's still not in an alliance, since Zach and Ty are using him. Luckily, Kuzi left him alone the next week due to big move itis, but Zach self-imploded which most certainly didn't help his game, and he was the easiest target in the next week under the invisible HOH, where no one went out of their way to keep him, and it was arguably the easiest vote of the entire season. At 130th is Ryan from Big Brother Canada 6. He's not below the others because he lasted quite a bit longer than some of the others, especially lasting a bit longer after his main mistake was made in comparison. He was on the outs on the first week with Hamza and Andrew, and was lucky to win HOH, but he nominated his two other allies for eviction, thinking that it would integrate him better in the house, which it didn't, and then he tried to backdoor Olivia, but chose poor pawns. After that, he started to slowly have some allegiance with the people in the White Room Alliance, but it's clear that no one respected him or used him as a genuine ally. He was going to be the final pre-Jora boot on Kayla's HOH, and was only spared because of the candidate's veto twist, where the producers edited the episodes in a way that would incentivize Ryan to be vetoed off the block by Canada. It only ended up delaying his eviction for a week, where he became the first Jora. At 129th is Andrew from Big Brother Canada 6. He definitely played really poorly throughout his short time in the house, and while a part of it was due to the heaven and hell twist, which is brought on out of attention on him, he didn't tender the situation the best way he could, and his actions caused him to be on the outs. He decided to campaign against Alejandra when the eviction was already set in stone, and apparently doing most of it the night before, when people already made their minds and used it as a reason to target him in the second week. He had really poor conversations with people during the second week of the season, the house was able to convince his close ally in Ryan to nominate him, and he just kind of waited out his eviction. He would probably stand out in a negative way on most seasons, and the social, in addition to the strategic strengths needed, aren't there, but partially went because his ally stupidly threw him under the bus. 128th is Kyle from Big Brother Canada 2. A part of me thought that I put him very low on the list, and I was thinking that maybe I overreacted, but with time I realized that I really didn't. The house really disliked him from the very beginning, which is interesting since people in his archetype usually isn't hated, but it makes his poor social game stand out even more. It causes him to be on the out, and when week 2 came in, he, as well as Adele and Paul, picked fights with the entire house, and he ended up being backdoored, since he was more intimidating physically than Paul. While he was aware that he probably was going to be backdoored, he just 
didn't seem awful strategically compared to Adele and Paul, so people found him to be dangerous, and a lot of people found him to be extremely disingenuous and hard to get to know, which is a problem in a social game. Kyle seemed to have taken some responsibility and really get introspective once he was out of the house, but then postseason kind of showed why the house guests didn't like him, and I really don't have good faith that he would do well on another season. The final person, not only just in the lack of allies or poor allies sub-tier, but the final person in the abysmal tier overall is Santina from Big Brother Canada 11. When you look at her game week by week, it's really atrocious all around. She alienated herself from people who tried to work with her except the guys, where half of those guys are using her, and she ended up targeting someone who was interested in working with her. She realized that she was used on her HOH and then loses her showmance the following week, and the people who were trying to use her in the and Tai abandoned her soon afterwards. She was nominated in the third week, where she was the initial target, and even despite Zach being put up, there was a lot of discussion about sending her home. Santina wins the secret HOH and uses it poorly, as Dan and Tai were not her biggest concerns at this point, and everyone knew that she was the secret HOH. Canada gave her immunity the following week, where she would have gone home otherwise, and then she goes home in the Fatal Feast, where it is in no one's best interest to get rid of her, since she's a loner and has no chance of winning the season. She was socially poor, strategically poor, and good competitively, but at least she had a few more allies than the others below her, hence her placement here. So, the bad here are obviously for people who have less than good traits to do well in Big Brother, are mostly poor players, they might have one to two at best redeemable qualities, and are people who have mostly went home or just really didn't do much of anything that's really notable or even mediocre during their runs on Big Brother Canada. So the first few people in this tier are a collection of first boots, and the first person in this tier at 126th is Julie from Big Brother Canada 9. From what we see, she's relatively active in the game, is gaming with people, and immediately makes an alliance with people like Austin, Brayden, and Victoria. At the same time, she was also seen as one of the weaker people on the team, and due to her being so messy, people like Latoya thought that Julie was a loudmouth liability, which Julie even admitted. We see Julie tell people about what Josh said, when she should have just kept it quiet. Due to the twist of the first week, she probably wouldn't have been the first boot, and she was not the target for most of the week, hence her not being in the lowest tier, but I think her messiness would cause her to be an early boot more often than not. At 125th is Kat from Big Brother Canada 1. Her eviction is still relatively confusing, since she was genuinely trying to help Suzette, but it freaked Suzette out and it ended up with Kat being nominated, but it shows that Kat's social cue and her social game wasn't great anyways. And from the episode, it didn't seem like she was a quick outcast, so that it's going to be a problem if she's on most seasons, and her campaigning really wasn't good. She just seemed out of her depth on Big Brother. 124th is Paige from Big Brother Canada 4. At first, I did feel bad for her, and thought she was somewhat robbed when her eviction happened in real time, but after 8 years and we watched I don't feel that way anymore. It was clear that she was out of her element, despite being one of the bigger fans of the se- in the season. She did not socialize with people over the first few days and was the last person to speak to the HOH, which not only made it easy for her to be nominated, but easy for the house guests to vote her out. Even in her intro package, she stated some things that were blatant oxymorons or contradictory to one another and it seemed like she didn't know fully what she was doing. She did go in a split vote, but it wasn't due to her campaigning, but the others following what the HOH wanted. The final person in this first boots grouping is John Michael from Big Brother Canada 11. His strategy going into the season was being a competition beast, calling people out, and targeting all the guys, which all this just was never going to be a very attainable one, since like Paige, it seemed like he wasn't capable of actually doing what he was talking about. He had a few shallow relationships, and even fewer game relationships, so it was very easy for him to be thrown up, and while people did feel bad for him, no one really watched to save him whatsoever. I don't see him doing well on most seasons, but he didn't play the worst, and it could be argued that he was somewhat screwed over, due to someone he saw as a potential ally selling him out stupidly. So this sub tier is for people who are just relatively blind to any and everything that was happening in the house, 
And the first person in this up tier at 122 is Eddie from Big Brother Canada 7. He did not do a whole lot wrong, but he didn't do much right in the season either. He wanted to play under the radar, which is fine and all, but you need to form relationships, and he didn't really form bonds with most of the house guests. Some people did like him, but they never considered him to be an important ally, and when the pre-jury double eviction came, it was not shocking that he would be the one who was swiftly booted. I also think that due to cultural differences, and him just in general not being a very social person, I don't see him doing well on most BB seasons, and his strategy was mediocre at best with being under the radar, but even his reads on certain situations and people weren't the best either. At 121st is Emily from Big Brother Canada 5. There really isn't much to say about her, though I should have more to say about her compared to the others since she is a final pre-juror. She was close to Dylan and somewhat to Dallas from the beginning, and they ended up on the outs when they voted incorrectly on the mark vote, but didn't have much allegiance to anyone else to overcome it. The supposed alliance she was in always preferred Dylan over her, so she was always going to be the first out. She was a poor strategist and a horrible campaigner, and a lot of the newbies just didn't care for her either. She was just an expendable pawn who wasn't meant to have longevity. At 120th is her first returnee in Dallas from Big Brother Canada 4 and 5. I know a lot of people feel like his BB Can 5 game is better than his BB Can 4 game, and I somewhat see why people think that. I honestly thought the same thing before this rewatch. In the season, Dallas actually had a relatively solid alliance with Maddie and Ramsey, and had loose connections to Shari and Lavida and Paige. He was in a good spot before he blatantly lied about his vote during the first week, or he lied about it his first week vote during the second week, and he was able to win two Vitos, though he did nothing with them other than building a larger target on his back. At the same time, he was loud, obnoxious, and rubbed the house guests the wrong way, and he could not get his allies to make the right moves in not getting rid of Levita, and he was all over the place strategically. He completely buried himself during his final week, and while he was close to staying, I don't know how much of that was his own doing. As we have seen, he isn't able to pr improve on his mistakes. He didn't do a whole lot wrong this time around, but he didn't do much right at all. There was a supposed veteran's alliance made in the first week, but he was never really included in it, and they mentioned that he would never report back to them, which is why he ended up being in the position he was in, or one of the reasons. So not only is he not good with the veterans, but he also grouped himself with the unpopular newbies and ended up voting on the wrong side of the first vote. It made him a very easy target for the next week, and when he was on the block, he thought that throwing Dylan under the bus, who wasn't even nominated and didn't take part in his nomination, was the right move, but many of the house guests even saw that was fake. Or that's what they thought. At 119th is Kira from Big Brother Canada 7. It's one thing to be a bad player in the game, but it's another thing to be a bad player and an overconfident one as well, especially when it was just not warranted. She thought she knew so much, but really knew very little, and lied to act superior over most of the house. She had tunnel vision over Samantha, Adam, and Chelsea the entire season, even when they offered several olive branches to her, and she didn't pick up on the fact that one of her closest allies in Dane was untrustworthy when he voted the opposite of everyone else during the Mackie vote until it was too late, and unlike Estefania and Damien, Dane wasn't even protecting her hardcore, so she had a big target that caused her to be the first expandable person from the group. And with the way she revised history when she was out of the house, there clearly is a lack of self-reflection there that would cause her to do better if she were to ever return. At 118th is Austin from BB Can 9. Her biggest issue in this season was that she was way too passive and it caused the game to be played around her, to the point where she ended up on the outs for good. And what made things worse is that she actively ruined things or she had the chance to do big things, as she was actually the first HOH, so she had a huge benefit that could have and should have centered the dynamics and strategy in her favor, but she didn't even do that. She got way too comfortable in the game, and thought she was closer to the likes of Tashan and Judson than she really was, and she didn't maintain her relationship with Victoria, which caused the latter to idiotically target her during the secret HRH, and even people like Tara and Tina, who she was supposedly aligned with, didn't feel comfortable around her and didn't know where her head was at, so that relationship weakened too. When she did choose her side, she chose the losing side and was one of the bigger targets on the losing side. 
just seemed like the aloofness was her general personality, and because she really knows nothing about how to really play the game, I don't know how she would actively improve if she was on another season. So I think it warranted her spot here. 117 is Mirren from Big Brother Canada 6. His entire run on the season is just really underwhelming. He was voted into the house on week 2 due to the Angels vs Devils twist, so he was able to miss out on the first week, and was given immunity during the second week. The house immediately doesn't trust him or Veronica, and did not find him to be useful in any way. He eventually did choose a side, but it was the losing side. He became a pawn during the last few rounds of his time in the house, and seemed like he was starting to somewhat integrate, especially with Derek and Kayla, but it was just way too late, and him integrating with them only made his target grow during his final week. He's just too passive in every facet, and I don't see him improving on most other seasons either. At 116th is AJ from Big Brother Canada 1. There's really nothing there when you look at his game. He was not intending on being a floater, and he wasn't even that, since a floater is someone who actively plays every single side, and he became a coaster throughout the season. AJ was close to Andrew, and had a few other shallow relationships, but no solid alliances, and the house just used him as a pawn a few times because of how expendable he was. He wanted his humor to endear people to him, and while he was disliked, he was not in any important alliances, and he knew that he would be pawned out of the house eventually, which happened during the first ever instant eviction, where you could argue that he was screwed, but he wasn't lasting much longer anyways, and just showed how expendable he was. The final person in this subgroup at 115th is Nikki from BBCan4. First, I just wanted to say rest in peace to Nikki. But out of everyone on this list, she had absolutely no game and never even tried to have any game. She was lucky to skip the first week and was given immunity. The second week when she came in, she immediately started having meltdowns about being a half knot and threatened to leave several times. Essentially, Nikki was used as a vote by Tim and even Mitch to a lesser extent throughout the entire season and she was extremely emotional and a vengeful player. No one respected her in the game, and no one wanted her to win the season, partially because she's an international, but partially because she was just a weak player. Even her closest allies didn't want to take her to the end as a goat, when that was her best usage. Nothing to really say about her otherwise. So this next tier are for people who are just kind of, in general, just very messy. And the first person in this tier, at 114th, is Greg from Big Brother Canada 3. I'm shocked he's this high, since I don't think very highly of his game at all, but it makes sense when you're ranking people who didn't last long in PBCAN. Pros of his is that he was in a majority alliance for the entire time he was on the season called the Chop Shop, even though half of the people in that alliance didn't take it seriously, and they were for the most part protecting him, until they had no choice but to let him go. At the same time, he had an extremely obnoxious personality that rubbed most of the house the wrong way. It made him a huge target and was extremely pushy slash anxious, which heightened his paranoia and made him paranoid. Duh. I don't see him playing well in any other seasons he was on, and I don't see him playing any other way, so he is here. At 113th is Cindy from Big Brother Canada 3 and Big Brother Canada 5. What is there really to say about this one? She got nominated by the house because she made a Poor first impression on the cast overall, and might have gone home if she didn't win the veto. She made the poor error of game talking with all of the girls in the HOH room when none of them were the HOH before seeing who else was in the room, which caused Kevin to tell people that there was a girls' alliance and it got her evicted, especially since she had no allies. The fact that she was evicted pre jury is enough of a reason to put her as dead last on this list. But she's on this list because she was given the chance to return and had to earn immunity and made the worst possible choice she could in evicting Kishermans, who was one of the few people who actually wanted to work with her, and she did that because she was given information by the other pre-jurors, since they were not sequestered separately and she wouldn't have had any of this information if they were sequestered on their own. Everyone rightfully distrusts her, and then she has the nerve to complain about no one wanting to work with her, because they refuse to give her tired campaign to the time of day. And as we have seen, she always really gets to play like this, which means that she doesn't have the ability to really learn from her mistakes, or at least as quickly or as well as she should. One thing that she proved is that for many people who do return, they end up going back to their old habits, despite their best efforts to change their faults. 
Cindy was actually doing very well for the first several weeks of the season. She was in a solid alliance this time and was laying under the radar, while the bigger players and personalities were handling the strategicness of the game as she started making bonds with people and the bigger personalities were starting to target one another. But she completely folded when she had agency to make a choice for the first time in the game. All I could did was ask her to put up Nara once and she wasn't even forceful with it. Cindy had ample opportunity to make the optimal move in keeping her so the big targets can continue going after one another, which Nera, Bruno, and even slightly Kevin gave her that opportunity and mentioned to her. It's clear that she still suffered from big move-itis, and the one person in the house that she didn't have a relationship with in Dylan sent her home next, and Cindy still sucks at campaigning. At 112th is Victoria from Big Brother Canada 9. For a long time, I had her and Santina right next to one another in my gameplay rankings since they had very similar journeys in the Big Brother seasons, but the main difference is that there were a few weeks where Victoria wasn't in danger and was in a decent spot. She was aligned with Austin, Brayden, and Julia in the first week, and then lost Julia while she kind of just did her own thing in the second week. Victoria went HOH and plans to go after Latoya, but also gained her allies, but Victoria handles this in such a slobby way where she never fully gains Jed and Ty's trust while having a hostile relationship with Beth that would eventually cause her undoing. She was a part of the alliance with the other side of the house, but was an extremely expendable and unreliable ally, which caused them to toss her to the side in the very next week under Kiefer's HOH. She wins the secret HOH and uses it poorly to target Austin of all people, who was one of the few people in the house who actually trusted her, and she ended up becoming the first juror. She was way too untrustworthy, had very poor reads, and failed at being a floater, while being good at comps and making poor moves while in power. It will be interesting to see how BB Ken 12 changes her position. At 111th is just from BB Ken 10. Another person I wasn't expecting to rank so highly on this list, especially how their journey was throughout their time on BB Ken. Jess rubbed people the wrong way initially and picked fights over the dumbest things, which helped them be the target on the first week, but won the clutch veto when their butts needed to be saved. After that, they slowly started making bonds with key players like Kevin, Marty, etc., and was even in an alliance with some of the girls, but Jess was always expendable, but it cost half of the house to want to keep them around. At the same time, they could never get the Hermans or the Mooses off their back, and when they got to power, it sealed Jess's fate, especially after they poorly ran their HOH right before this and sent home Tanisha, who wasn't after them. At the same time, due to the bonds Jess created, they almost stayed against Gino, so there are some redeeming factors. At the same time, I don't see Jess improving on their game, skills, or learning from their mistakes if they played again. At 110th is Kira from BBCan7, and I did not intentionally go out of my way to put two non-binary husk guests next to each other on this tier list. They were a target in the first few weeks due to their meltdowns and emotional episodes, caused them to be on the outs. Kyra was the initial target during Dane's first HOH, but Mackie's several screw-ups caused them to stay in the house though it had nothing to do with what Kira was actually doing to make sure that happened. After that, it was clear that Kira was going to make it to the end as a goat, but they will be used as a pawn at several points throughout the season. Had absolutely no chance of winning a jury vote against anyone, and while there were moments where they saw the bigger picture, they ignored it and would act very arrogant towards other people. So, emotionally, they were either very gloomy or very petty and arrogant. Also, kind of a know-it-all where I could easily see them going home early on most seasons. And the final person in this messy subgroup or subcategory at 109 is Jackie from BBCan5. She didn't have any major alliances in the first week and lost her close ally mark in the first week. She tried getting close to Cassandra and William, but that ended up backfiring when Cassandra left earlier, and she did something that caused William to deter from her. After being used as a pawn, she got relatively close to Netta and was supposed to be numbers for that side of the house, but Netta ends up going home after Jackie reels herself. She makes an alliance with Bruno and Kevin, but sells that out a week after it's made. Most of the house did not trust her due to how loose with information she was and how much of a consistent victim she was in the game, and how personally she saw the game, and she had an obsession with Aika. She ended up going home over the showman's who was dominating the season because she was just so expendable and annoying. Poor socially, poor strategically, and I don't remember her doing particularly well in competitions either. 
at 108 is Tala from BB Can 1. There was little to no strategy with Tala whatsoever. People saw her as a floater in the beginning, but she wasn't floating and was just coasting for the first several weeks of the season. Was brought into the East Coast Alliance because they needed a number, didn't offer anything strategically whatsoever to the season, and wasn't good at competitions, while actively pissing off many people in the house due to her meltdowns and entitlement. Apparently it was a threat to win, but it was because the jury knew that she would be the most ridiculous winner ever, and it was due to nothing of her own doing. Her game is not repeatable whatsoever, and would most likely cause her to be an earlier out. 107 goes to Corey from BB Can 7. A part of me felt like I should have put her in the potential tier, since I put Allison, who also entered her season late, in that tier, but there are some major differences in their games. She really wasn't involved in any alliance, and while it seemed like she was close with Kaylin, she threw her under the bus to get closer to Adam, Sam, and Chelsea, but she was still never in an alliance with them. She luckily got close to Anthony, which protected her for a few weeks, especially in week 5, where Dane, Estefania, Damien, and etc. were pushing hardcore for Corey to go up as a backdoor option. She somewhat had a relationship with Samantha, who protected her that week. Corey went to HOH and is tricked into targeting Samantha, which leaves her on the outs, and the entire house remains annoyed with her. I almost put her higher because she was booted due to a twist, but she wasn't lasting much longer anyways. She was poor strategically and socially, which are huge things to overcome. At 106 is Richelle from BB Can 2. She played a very poor game from start to finish, now that I really think about it. Was in the group of catty mean girls, which wasn't even a technique group, and encouraged them to play as catty and personally as possible. She failed at getting Heather out, and that was used to get Ika out on her H or H, which left her on a weaker position, and she wasn't even a part of the first five alliance, but got lumped in with them after Canada's H or H. She was on the outs for the rest of the season, could not infiltrate in the alliance, and wasn't a jury threat. She was decent in some competitions, and was poor in every other category, mainly socially and strategically. I could see her making it far-ish on some other seasons, but this would also cause her to be an early out on many other seasons as well, and I don't know if she has the skill set to improve on her mistakes. Number 5 goes to Sabrina from BB Can 2. They, meaning the edit, made it seem like Sabrina was running and masterminding the house for the first half of it, but the only person she was really running was Rachelle, and she talked her into making a bad move. In general, Sabrina was being ran by the other First 5 Alliance members, and no one in the house, including her allies, respected her, so her chances of winning were very low to begin with. Of course, Canada's HOH screwed her infrastructure over, and she does become a pawn essentially for the rest of the season, as everyone knows that she is a jury goat. Her personality rubbed people the wrong way, she was horrible in competitions, and her strategy was nowhere near as good as she thought it was. I don't have faith that she would do better as a player. She's either going to be an early out or a drag to the end, just like she was in this season on pretty much any other season. At 104 is Pilar from BB Can 3. There is really nothing there strategically to Pilar. Desperately needed to be guided by Kevin, who needed to be guided his damn self in the season, and Ashley throughout the entire season. She ended up on the block in the first week, but would have stayed even without Canada's vote. She didn't have any alliances for several weeks in the game, and was left alone because she was not threatening whatsoever, and didn't know what was going on. Their diaper alliance was formed, and it did benefit her for sure, and she won an HOH that she did nothing with, essentially. I do think the language barrier hurt her in the game, and she was a nice woman, but I don't think she was strong socially either. I see her either getting dragged along in most seasons, like she was in this season, or taken out early if she's on the wrong side. There's really nothing to say about her pertaining BB strengths. The final person in the sub tier of people who are just kind of passive and just there at 103 is Karen from BB Can 5. Based on how virtually every other older woman has performed in BB Can, Karen is extremely lucky that not only was she on a returning season, causing her to be a smaller target, but she ended up winning the first HOH, where she could have been the first boot otherwise. After her HOH, everyone agreed to just leave her alone, since everyone in the house knew that she was a goat who could be easily beaten. Karen was out of the loop for most of the season, didn't know what was happening strategically half of the time, and was very one-dimensional in her strategy, being laser-focused on getting Kevin out, even making moves that guarantees that she won't win. Not good in competitions, not good socially, and not good strategically, who would be in early boot on most seasons. 
This sub tier is for people who have a few slight pros under their mostly bad. And at 102 is Tom from BBCan1. Another one that I wasn't expecting to be this high, though he's still in the bad tier. Tom was able to get into an alliance with Emmett, Peter, and Alec, called the Quattro, and they had control over the first few weeks. At the same time, he made the outsiders feel like crap, and they targeted him throughout his run, and him being nominated the first week, where he probably goes home if the noms stayed the same. Strategically, he was extremely emotional, like targeting Suzette out of all people, and had to constantly be micromanaged by the likes of Liza and Emmett. Peter and Alec turned on him early because they didn't like him, and he ended up spilling his alliance to Liza. Don't think he's able to learn from his mistakes, so I think he would get booted around here on most seasons. Just missing out at the top 100 at 101 is Kaylin from BBCan7. She, like most of the people that are in the bad tier part are at this point and above are people who I almost consider putting in the potential tier. She was definitely someone that surprised me when I rewatched the franchise overall, as I was expecting her to be much worse than she actually was. Kaylin's social game actually wasn't bad, and there were a lot of people that liked her, and a group of people who did want to work with her. It wasn't great, and she definitely had her fair share of enemies, hence why she ended up going home early, but I was expecting her to be very poor socially, which wasn't the case. She definitely had the strategic mind for the game that makes her decent in that area, and it caused for people to unjustly see her as some sort of mastermind, especially after the failed flip vote for Mackie. In general, I do think she struggles on most seasons she's on just due to the generation gap, and her lying about her age was just really bad. At 100th is Moose from BB Can 10. Rewatching the season was very shocking, especially regarding how bad he was in the game, and I didn't think highly of him as a player to begin with. He came in the game wanting to cause chaos and to be the influencer slash manipulator, but he did not have the skill set to do that and quickly brought unwanted eyes on him. He was a part of the majority alliance at the time, but his sketchiness and messy gameplay not only put him on the out of that alliance, but he was actively targeted by Kyle, who would have went home had he not won the veto. Sorry, he would have went home had he not won the veto that week. And then after that, he kept on consistently throwing Carmine and Tanisha under the bus, who were his supposed allies, and had absolutely no idea what was happening, where he was used as a pawn on Jess's HOH and almost went home. And then he ended up being the actual pawn that went home during his final week, since Gino didn't want to backdoor Marty anymore. He is good at competitions, but had no coherent strategy, and people thought he was extremely disingenuous. So his social game was a very mixed bag in the season. And I don't have high hopes of him improving as a player, since it's not even known how much of a fan he got into the show after the season, or if he's really following the intricacies of strategy and whatnot. At 99th is Adele from BB Can 2. Something tells me that I have him a lot lower than most people, but I really saw little to no good things about his game. He alienated himself from most of the house with Kyle and Paul by their actions in the first few weeks, and while he starts forming some relationships, he was never brought in a solid alliance, and when he did try with Aika, she just ended up going home next. Canada's HOH was the reason why he was in a good position, and it wasn't due to his own gameplay. We got to see how he played when he was in the majority, and it was awful. His strategy of pissing people off so he can be taken to the end, and hoping that his final speech can woo people over is just a horrible. And when he wasn't making poor strategic moves, like targeting the goblins when he was at the bottom of his alliance, he was playing way too much for Canada. While he did start forming some relationships with the season that would become somewhat worthy, it was until pretty much all of his main relationships failed with the people who kept on leaving, and I don't have any inclination that he would do better on another season or improve strategically or competitively, or just in general, to do better on another season. At 98 is Zach from BB Can 11. I've made it very clear on how I don't think his game is good at all, and I don't think he has any potential to do better due to his lack of ability to take accountability, admit wrongdoing, and self-reflecting. He is higher than many of the others because he did have some control and influence, which he used in the first few weeks and rounds of the game. 
and a lot of people did genuinely want to work with him throughout the season. The issue is, he bulldozed his way to get what he wanted and was very open about it, which would obviously cause people who don't want to be do bulldozed and want to control their own agency to put a stop to it, in addition to the people he burned by turning on eyes for no reason to want to help in making his downfall happen. He has big move ideas and wants to make it known to people, which almost never works, and he can just never just relax and let around play for himself and let his social game do the work for him. He underestimated people who weren't his allies, and when he was in danger, he completely crumbled with the stunt he pulled and eventually quitting because he was getting voted out. At 97th is Andrew from BB Can 2. He was obviously going to be on the higher end for a few reasons. One, he is a late pre juror, so we just have a lot more information about him as a player compared to others who went earlier. And the second reason is that he was absolutely twist screwed by Canada, where many of the first or the non first fivers admitted that they wouldn't have targeted him that week without the twist. He was able to get into a solid alliance that had a lot of influence in the game and was able to somewhat get along with the other guys while being good in competitions. At the same time, he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way with his attitude and actions, even with some of his allies being annoyed by him. And while he was more focused strategically than Tom in comparison, he still wasn't good strategically and he was very entitled about his strategy and had no time to convince people to do what he wanted. He probably makes it a bit further on most seasons, which is why he's a bit higher, but he just sucked when he was nominated. But it is different being nominated by your country instead of a house guest. At 96 is Will from BB Can 6. He is someone who was doing pretty well socially at first, but then things started changing around the Jesse boot. Someone who wasn't targeting him whatsoever. He started showing more of the temperamental side of him and started acting like a very whiny baby. He got very entitled whenever people didn't do what he wanted and was essentially led by Paris and to a lesser extent Maddie throughout the entire season. He was very emotional and not strategic throughout the entire season, was considered the big jury goat out of everyone who made it to jury outside of Ryan and couldn't win a competition. Also made the dumb choice of being conned by Derek to drop in the final five veto where he could have saved his eyes from going home that round and took no accountability in general. Outside of being a pouty child who can use his Eastern voice and behavior to somewhat of a benefit, he doesn't have what it takes, period. The final person in this sub tier group at 95th is Hamza from BB Can 6. Now we are at the final Pedro in the bad tier, and he's in the top 20 where I've made it my thoughts on Hamza as a player very clear, especially with how manipulated and outright false the edit for him was. Strategically, he was so all over the place, and that's me putting it very nicely. He was campaigning for Rosina to stay, but didn't do it well enough and was sloppy with it, and aligned with people who were at the bottom of the house with Andrew and Ryan, causing him to be nominated in the second week. He did win the HOH in the third week, and we did see him start making good relationships with people in the white room, so I think he was genuinely improving as a social player, even with Erica who was in the red room. He was easily convinced by Derek and Kayla to not target him despite all the mouth he had against them in the earlier weeks and targeted Jesse for personal reasons where the edit made it seem like it was a mastermind move. He kept on mentioning that he was causing chaos for no reason and it really did nothing but he did align with the losing side and was backdoored by Olivia whom he had no relationship with whatsoever but a lot of people were very sad about his eviction which says something about him in a good way I guess. So this final stretch of people in the bed here are people who made it to the jury portion of the season. So in general, these are pretty much jurors who I feel like are really bad at the game, and there's really not much hope for them on any season, hence them being here despite making it further than some of the pre-jurors who are higher on this tier list. So the first person in the subgroup at 94th is Tara from BBCan9. Gosh, I don't even know where to begin with this one. No one in the house respected her for a majority of the season, and while she eventually got into an alliance with the other side, she didn't have great relationships with many of them. She tried to save quite a few of the boots that went home in the pre-jury, examples being Kyle and Austin, and failed at doing both, so she wasn't even good at spraying people. In addition to that, she was way too laser-focused on Tishan and Jetson throughout the season, where it came off disturbing at times. 
She became a target during the early jury phase, since there was a limited amount of people on the other side, and she was used to take out Jetson, where they planned to and did take her out right afterwards. She became a threat and came back due to a twist, where she came back and always lower on people based on that. Strategically not good, was a mixed bag at best socially, and was mediocre in competitions. At 93rd is Maddie from BB Ken 4. I saw the list and was struggling to remember why I had her below Raul, but then I remembered that her social game was definitely worse than Raul's from a social standpoint, though I don't think his was really good either. She plays in a rather impulsive way where she is led by her emotions, and while I appreciate her willingness to play a strategic game, she never actively does so. Targeting Lovita was a really stupid move, and the fact that she thought that it would integrate herself in the house more was hilarious, especially since she was very close to going home the round afterwards. She actively weakened her alliance and was very obsessed with getting Kelsey out of the house, which was apparent during her second HOH. Most people distrusted her, and she doesn't have a self-reflective personality, which is a very bad trait for a big brother, and her strategy as well as her social game left much to be desired, as she was on the outs for most of the season due to her own actions. At 92nd is Raul from BB Ken 4. The only reason why he is higher than Maddie is mainly because I think he had a better social game in comparison, at least for most of the season, or he was aligned with people who had better social games. He really had strong ties with Jared and Kelsey, which helped him out throughout the season, and has a relatively under the radar vibe to him, despite his larger than life personality. Jared and Kelsey did most of the strategizing, and that was a benefit to him since when he did have to be strategic in his final two weeks, he blew it. Jared told him to not mention anything about Mitch, but he did exactly that, which caused them to have to target him that week, when that wasn't the initial plan, as they wanted to keep it in their back pocket and to hope to kind of manipulate Mitch in some way. Raoul was presented with the opportunity to change his mind by his own allies, but he refused to do so, even when it would have actively improved his game. And when it came to his final week in the house, he helped Jared win the veto, when they should have thrown Raul the veto, or thrown the veto to Raul so he could take one of them off and send home the non-trio alliance member that would have been the replacement. He can't self-reflect, is one of the weakest strategic people ever, actually one of the worst strategic people ever, and people really disliked him socially by his final week. At 91st is Damien from BB Can 7. He was someone who was overhyped for absolutely no reason, and the person who represents overhype the most out of anyone in BB Can history. He was able to see Dane and Adam make an alliance throughout the privilege he was given, and whatever he did actively caused Adam to nominate him. Most of the house was staged throughout the entire season that he barely spoke to people, and would outright refuse to strategize at times as well. He stuck with Estefania and Dane throughout the entire season, and while his social game wasn't bad, it really wasn't good either, as he was just on the surface, nice with people, was pretty poor strategically, wasn't good in competitions, and has a mediocre social game, was kept around because he was the biggest non-threat out of the non-pretty boys. At 90th is Estefania from BB Can 7. I will say that she did try to be strategic. Sometimes throughout the season, but the issue is, she was doing whatever Dane told her to do, which was really ever actually good for her, but she was extremely tunnel visioned on Adam, Samantha, and Chelsea, completely ignoring whatever else was going on in the house. The thing is, she was so confident about what was happening in the house when she was really ever right, and in general was just way too passive, but I give her props for not being completely hopeless, like Damien and Kira was at times. I think she was fine socially, since a lot of the house guests liked her on a surface level, and in a season that wasn't obsessed with gender, she probably does better. But there is no point where she ever woke up in the season, which even Kira did at the end, but she isn't as terrible as some of the others, so she benefits here and did decently in competitions, despite not winning one in the entire season. At 89th is Renee from BB Can 11. It's interesting that she came in wanting to be a social mastermind, but her biggest fault in the game was her social skills. She was at the bottom of her alliance for the entire season, and a lot of the other house guests either actively disliked her or distrusted her, so it caused her to not build strong relationships that she could use in the future for herself, and made her more reliant on Shania and Claudia. She was nominated 
a lot throughout the season, and it didn't help her position in the game. It seemed like she was the best strategically out of the three, since she was the only one who didn't really waver on Zack, and wasn't as easily flip-floppy like the others, but she was undercut by her own allies on her HOH and made a final three with Ty, who was of course going to cut her, since he wanted to cut off Claudia's friends. She had some right ideas, but the execution was almost always sloppy, and there's a huge social hole that I think she wasn't even aware of and would cause her to be a boot earlier more often than not. At 88 is Maddie from BB Can 6. She is very similar to Renee in my opinion, as they are both big fans of the game and has a lot of solid ideas but doesn't know how to put it together, in addition to being the third wheel in their alliances. I feel like the main difference is that she's a bit better strategically and was able to form a few individual bonds like with Johnny, but that eventually withered away. She was guest lit a lot by her alliance and was almost consistently targeted, but was able to get out of a few gems. But the biggest issue with her is that she really liked the social game to pull off the strategy and moves that she wanted to pull, even within her alliance. People just didn't like, trust, or respect her in the house. That was always a big hurdle for her, which is a main component of why she ended up here. And the final person in this tier in general and sub tier at 87th is Hope from BB Can 11. He clearly came into the season with the hopes of improving his social media profile, not realizing that no one who watches BB Can cares enough about their social media enough to follow these house guests like that or to boost them in that way, and knew nothing about what he was getting himself into. For the first three ish weeks, he was told everyone in the house how he wanted to be sent home and was kept on the outs of the few alliances that he was in. He volunteered to be on the block several times throughout the season and got himself involved in what would become Lettergate, which definitely did not help his game. But once he got into the crown, he became a bit more stable and started to learn the game more, which is why he's in the top of this tier. But he unknowingly caused the start of the downfall of his alliance by volunteering to be on the block during Ty's HOH, and he only made it through that week because Jonathan asked to be voted out. I do think he would have been a better played heir if he ever plays again, and he does have the ability to learn as he goes. So the next tier is the potential tier, and these are people who I feel like are extremely inconsistent to the point where I didn't know where to put them, though that's usually the case for the jurors that I put on this list, but a lot of the people in this tier tend to be pre-jurors who I feel like got a raw deal, a bad shake, and were showing a lot of promise, but they were snipped before they could really show what they could do, and I feel like would do better on other seasons if they were given that chance. So, the first sub-tier in this tier are for all the pre-jurors, and the first person in this tier overall at 86 is Anil from Big Brother Canada 1. He came in the era of BB Ken where there were a lot of contrived superfans who were trying to be like Dan and Will, and he did it poorer than most, hence his early boot in the season. It did not seem like he had many allies, and with the Quattro Alliance gunning for him in the beginning, especially Emmett, he thought he was much closer to Julian than he was, and the likes of Suzette and Gary outright disliked him. Many of the house guests immediately distrusted him and saw through his tactics immediately, which was why he ended up on the block in the second week. It did seem like he was starting to slowly integrate himself within the likes of Liza and even the shield, where he could have done some damage. He is on this tier because he was too skewed by the secret veto that had to be used, where he would have lasted longer, and who knows how much longer he would have ended up lasting. I don't know if he would do the same tryhard stuff in other seasons that he did in this season, though. At 85th is Liza from Big Brother Canada 1. Now that my review of BB Ken 1 in general is more distant, I might have put it a bit too high, especially since she is messy as hell online and has gotten into several online feuds. Strategically, she actually wasn't bad at all. She knew that Emmett was running the season and was full of shit, and she knew that Time was hiding a secret alliance from her. She knew that playing with the girls and guys was a good idea, but she was just sloppy with it. Competition-wise, she wasn't good, and she vastly overrated her social game, though I don't think it was that bad. When it comes to the game, it seemed like she had some awareness, but her messy personality is always going to be an issue. I can see her doing well in some other seasons, but I can also see her replicating this season on others as well. At 84th is Jay from Big Brother Canada 10. They are such a weird person to talk about, now that I'm comparing them to all of the pre-jurors on this list. 
From what we saw and heard about in the first week, Jay was not in a serious alliance, or really in an alliance in general, but we saw that they had close ties to Summer, Betty, Josh, Jess, and other relationships. Where entering week two, no one else but Marty was targeting them, and that only happened because Marty made a deal with Stephanie. It seemed like Jay had a chance to survive the week against JC Lynn, but she won the veto and Betty was nominated, so Jay was done. Strategically, there isn't much to discuss, but I do think that Jay was pretty good socially, and I see them doing well on other seasons if they're randomly placed in one, a la a Brayden or even a Gary run. At 83rd is Kyle from Big Brother Canada 9. He is definitely one of the more forgettable people not only on BB Ken 9, but in BB Ken in general, and it's clear why he was initially an alternate. He was able to get into and create a solid alliance with half of the house that needed to align with one another, and he was less sloppy than Rohan in comparison. Kyle was seemingly one of the more stabilizing forces in the alliance and in the season in general, but with the way he played and how he created a side versus side angle and weaker relationships with people not unassigned, he was bound to be targeted. I can see him doing well in some other seasons and more stable seasons, but he just made less mistakes than most of the others that are pre jurors. At 82nd is Neha from Big Brother Canada 3. One of the reasons why she ended up making it this high, especially compared to many of the others, is because she was blatantly twist screwed. She was booted in the third and final instant eviction ever, but in this version, Kevin had to make his nominations immediately, and then speaking to the other house guests, unlike the other two, where they were just sequestered for a while and then made their nominations. Under the assumption of it being a normal HOH, Neha was able to get Zach and Jordan on her side, and was able to so much talk Kevin into their beliefs, so it showed that Neha had a lot of potential to do strategic damage. She was able to have a lot of alliances in her short time in the house. Baby Can 3 was a mess regarding everyone having several alliances, and she did have loyal allies in the house like Sarah, Brittany, and Johnny. But her social game with some others was pretty weak because she had the resting bitch face and cannot fake being interested in other people when she wasn't. At 81st is Mark from Big Brother Canada 5. It's a shame that out of almost 60 pre-jurors, a first boot ended up beating roughly around 50 of them, but when you look at Mark, it does make sense. He was on a returning season, which instantly slants things against the newbie's favor, which we've seen in BBUS time and time again. Even with that, most of the veterans wanted to keep him around and actively worked to keep him around, to the point where he was booted in a split vote instead of the intended almost unanimous vote. Apparently, he did some active work into having a power relationship with Kieran, but most of the newbies didn't even want to target the big strong guys, when it's rare for them to be nearly booted first anyways. I feel like he does well on most seasons and did pretty good in the few comps he was in, though I don't know how he would have progressed strategically. At 80th is Johnny from Big Brother Canada 3. He is one of the more forgettable people in BB Ken history in my opinion. He didn't have a dramatic pre-jury fall, he was not in the majority alliance at any point in time, he didn't get into much drama, and his departure didn't really affect the season at all. Johnny definitely had a strategic mind, where he was cool with the girls and was trying to make bonds with some of the guys. There were a lot of nerdy guys in the season, so that helped him. But things just did not come together for him. It seemed like he was a bit too close to Neha and the other connections he was trying to build, like with Kevin, always saw him as extremely expendable. He was pretty solid in competitions from what I remembered, and I could see him doing well in some other seasons, but also doing pretty poorly in some seasons as well. In general, he just made a lot less mistakes than most of the other pre-jurors, hence his placement. At 79th is Chelsea from Big Brother Canada 7. She is one of the weirder ones to talk about in general pertaining Big Brother Canada. It seemed like she was doing well, and she had a good relationship with Kyra, Samantha, and Adam, while the other pretty boys did like her during the first few weeks, as they all voted to save Kira in week 2. But things definitely went downhill when she won in HOH, though she probably shouldn't have won it, and targeted Kaden, who wasn't thinking of her and wasn't a threat, while overestimating her relationships in the house. It seemed like she had the right idea strategically more often than not, and tried to have relationships with everyone in the house, but Adam unfortunately was playing for the guys to win and not in his best interest, so he sold her down the river when she was genuinely trying to help him, and it caused her to be booted. 
when she was in danger and on the block, she literally just crumbled and didn't fight to save herself. I do think she could do well in many other seasons, and then learn from her mistakes, but she's more stable than the other pre-jurors, hence her placement here. At 78th is Roberto from Big Brother Canada 11. His eviction is still one of the weirdest evictions I've ever seen in Big Brother Canada, for sure. And while some people you can mention didn't do much wrong that caused the evictions, I really don't feel that way about Roberto. I mean, he was in a guy's alliance, and they had a plan to make relationships with others, which they were successful in, and he did have other relationships outside of that alliance, which his allies were jealous about. Most of the people, including the HOH that eventually sent him home, wasn't even planning on targeting him entering week 2, or technically 3. I already mentioned how weird BB Ken 11 is with their weeks. And it was his own allies who were targeting him since Zach was a control freak and Terrell was jealous that there was another pretty, physical, showman's bait in the house outside of himself. I will say that he aligned with the guys too quickly before getting to know everyone and making allies afterwards, but it's hard to see people be so stupid and petty. He did good in the few competitions he played in, had a lot of good relationships, and was picking up on how to play strategically, so I think he would do well in most cases if he were to ever return or be on other seasons. At 77th is Latoya from Big Brother Canada 9. I really wish I had her mentality and vibe with how to handle foolishness in my everyday life. Latoya was able to build really close bonds with several people in the house, and that's a really key component in building solid, strong alliances, which many people on the list missed out on. And I do think that Latoya gets the strategy of the game, as she get rid of the people who are not only threats, but are not working with you whatsoever, which she used to cause the Julie boot. She was in the Sunsetter Alliance, and she tried to do the same thing with booting Rohan again, but it bit her in the butt, since she handled that sloppily. I really do think that her downfall was about a lot of people being threatened that she was close with the two straight guys with black ancestry, and Victoria used that and her jealousy as reason to get her out. I will say that the Latoya kind of just laid down when she was on her way out, but she definitely knew that she was the target. I do think that she could get herself into a strong alliance, and maybe learn that you campaign for yourself, or you can campaign for yourself without being seen as fake, and maybe work on being better with people not in your alliance, but I do think she has a very high ceiling. At 76th is Tanisha from Big Brother Canada 10. Honestly, one of the main reasons why I think she ended up going early and getting a lot of flack during her season is that she came out right after Tiffany in BB2 and E3, who dominated her season and people just saw two black mothers immediately thinking that Tanisha is as strategically skilled as Tiffany. She was able to get into a solid alliance that was the 8, and then once that split, she was a part of the girls' alliance and an agreement of some sorts that included most of the non-white people. While I don't think she was bad socially, and most of the house actually really liked her, she was not the social mastermind that everyone made her out to be. I don't think she was awful strategically, but I do think she was pretty mediocre strategically and had the standard strategy of making alliances. I think she needed to be more active strategically and needed to use her social relationships with people outside of her alliance more, since she just grouped herself with Summer and arguably Betty too much when she was not very individualistic. At 75th is Cal from Big Brother Canada 10. In a lot of ways, he reminds me of Zach from BB Can 11, but as you can see, there is a discrepancy in their placements, which I will definitely get into soon. Like Zach, Cal found himself in a powerful alliance, but he was actually in the majority of the house, which included 8 people, and he also had a side alliance with Gino, Herman, 2 people in his first alliance, JC Lynn and Stephanie, while having good relationships with Marty and Jess as well. He set himself up really well and wasn't being pushy with his pitches and motivations, but things fell apart when he won HOH. It was a mistake for him to win HOH when he's aligned with everyone or tied to most of the house guests, and was even worse that he nominated all of his allies for all three nominations and completely blew up his alliance because he was paranoid about all the non-white people having a cut alliance, which is just a huge eye roll. And then he goes home on his closest allies, HOH, the very next week. He's a bit higher because unlike Zach, he immediately realized that he made a lot of mistakes with how he played the game, and having that self-reflective trait really helps when it comes to being a BB player who performs better and better, instead of being one-dimensional, so I could see him improving if he were on other seasons. 
And the final person in this sub tier at 74th, and the final pre-drawer on this list, or this tier, is Jesse from Big Brother Canada 6. So he's the final person who was booted in a spot that was always going to be a pre-drawer spot, and the final person in this tier. I really don't think he did much wrong, like at all to justify his boot, but Johnny really just outplayed the hell out of him. He was in the real deal aligned with Paris, Derek, and Kayla while having good relationships with most of the people in the Red Room Alliance, while having the basics of strategy and then dynamics down pat. You could tell that he was picking up on the game pretty quickly, but I do fault him for being extremely passive when he was on the block. He did wake up in the last 24 hours, but it was just too late, and he might have had a better chance of staying if he campaigned more earlier. They portrayed it like a huge Hamza move, who was outplaying Jesse, but that was just very inaccurate. No one in the house for the most part, even Hamza, entered that week wanting to target Jesse. I could easily see him doing relatively well on most seasons if he was randomly placed in other seasons. So the second and last sub-tier of the potential tier are for the people who are jurors and yeah that's pretty much it so at 73rd is allison from big brother canada too so she was able to skip out on the first few weeks since the option to vote her in started in week two and she entered the house in week three this obviously put her in a huge disadvantage where most of the girls do not trust her and it caused for allison to immediately gravitate towards andrew but even his own alliance did not trust her Despite that, she was still lumped into that group of people, and I do think that Canada's HOH hugely benefited her. I think Andrew leaving caused her to actually have some agency of her own, where she eventually moved on to the Sloppy Seconds Alliance, though it was clear that she was at the bottom of that alliance, and I think she could have floated a bit better than she did. But she did have some solid strategic reads, and knew that she had to make a move to turn things in her favor, which she did in the double of Rito, but she didn't stick with it by keeping early. If she entered on time with everyone else, I do think she could have done a lot better in the season, but she isn't anything great or whatever. Definitely some potential, hence her being here. At 72 is Phil from Big Brother Canada 4. I have no idea how he would play if he were on his own, and this tends to happen with people who have to play with another person, but at least unlike the others, I'm including the baby US house guest as well, he never got to play just as his own player throughout the entire season. Because he was the fan out of himself and his brother, he claimed that he knew a lot more, so they ended up following his advice where he didn't know what he was doing a lot of the time, or he would just never admit it, but he often made the wrong choices. Phil got them into some sticky situations and arguments the entire season, wanted Jared's validation the entire season, where Jared gave him his ass to kiss until his final week in the house, alienated people by not committing to anything. He had the privilege of playing with his brother, where he most likely plays worse if he was on his own. At 71 is Kelsey from Big Brother Canada 4. If she did not return, I would most likely put her in the bad tier, despite showing some potential herself. She was mainly targeted at first because some of the women were jealous of her and didn't like her budding showman with Jared, though of course not targeting him since male privilege for you. Because Paige was a poor pawn and Kelsey had solid people working for and with her, she ended up staying. After this, she became more and more entitled, whined about damn near everything, and had the quote-unquote good people rhetoric. People saw through her game and saw her as the leader of the Third Wheel Alliance, which caused her to be booted forth as others wanted to work with Jared and Raw without her being present. Luckily for her, she was able to not only return to the game, but was able to watch silent feeds for the week and was able to boot Mitch but she started being called out that week for her messy gameplay, and she was also lucky that Lovita was able to give her information. She was kept around instead of Rob because she had better social relationships and he was annoying the hell out of people. Kelsey was able to rope the Paquette brothers in her alliance and was able to move on to them once her initial alliance was booted, where she was the more strategic force and did well in the endgame competitions. The issue for her is that she had trouble admitting that she lied, could get dirty and cutthroat, but she could be a well-rounded player at the time. At 70th is Samantha from Big Brother Canada 7. I mainly put her on this tier because she was all over the place, and she's one of the most inconsistent people I have ever watched in Big Brother history. She did have a lot of strategic insights at times, and had a really 
good gut feeling, like knowing that she probably would have been backdoored in week two based on how people acted towards her at the competition, knew Dane and Anthony were no good, and knew that she could not fully trust Adam as well as the guys alliance, which he denied, and he knew that she knew that he was lying about it. Samantha was good in competitions, and always went out of her way to make amends with people or try to form new relationships, but a lot of people just did not trust or jive with her, and it did not help that the first week started with Laura really putting a huge target on her back. I also think that her being on a gendered season did her no good, since her main ally was not playing within his best interest. I do think she has a lot of good instincts and could do very well under different environments. And the final person in this tier at 69th is Marty from Big Brother Canada 10. I put him here mainly because I didn't know where else to put him. Marty is such a chaotic and inconsistent player where he isn't mediocre but isn't one of the higher tiers that suggests being good and isn't really a bad player either. It seemed like he was on the out in the first week, but he was able to win HOH the second week and started making important relationships with people like Kyle, Gino, and Kevin. He had some other solid relationships over the next few weeks, but his chaotic and relatively toxic personality put people on ice and saw him as extremely emotional. But he was also the best competitor of the season, which was a huge benefit, and people used him as a meat shield to do whatever, mainly Kevin and Helena, where he was convinced to go after Herman on a second HOH. He was a very sneaky, conniving player, but wanted to be perceived as an honest player. So the first grouping of the mediocre tier are people who I like to call middling followers, and it pretty much says it all. They are borderline in one of the bottom tiers, but they're not crazy enough to be there. So the first person to be in the sub-tier and tier in general at 68th is Mark from Big Brother Canada 7. He is so lucky to have been included in the Pretty Boys Alliance, and it gave him an advantage over most of the cast, especially since he himself did not contribute much to the Alliance. His social game was awful, since most of the people who were not in the Alliance really disliked him and actively targeted him through a lot of the season. He was lucky that his Alliance protected him. He talked about targeting his alliance early on, but then folded at the quickest possibility possible and let Anthony completely railroad his age of age, which caused the house to respect him even less. And then he ends up going home in the final five, when he shouldn't have been, since he was nominated against the strongest player in the house and he is the easiest goat, but he couldn't even accomplish that. He is in this tier because he was more aware of the dynamics solely because of the alliance he was in. The next person in this tier at 67th is Rohan from Big Brother Canada 9. I feel like a lot of people got hyped off of him because of how Kiefer treated him in the season, and because he won three vetoes in a row, but he's actually very underwhelming as a player. He came into the season wanting to be a schema strategist and was not able to fulfill that at all. He got into a pair with Kyle, and people immediately distrusted him, to the point where he became an early target. There was an attempted flip that Latoya started to get him out, but it didn't happen because Tina and Victoria to a lesser extent stopped it, in addition to it just being done very sloppily. He did not handle Kifor and Latoya well at all during the third week, which only increased his target, but he and Cal were able to build an alliance with Austin, Brayden, Tara, Tina, and Victoria. Unfortunately for him, his alliance kept on losing HH competitions and numbers after this, causing him to be nominated for the rest of his time in the season, and he had to win Vitos to remain safe, in addition to neglecting Victoria, causing her to turn on Austin, a middling player overall who will probably perform around here on most seasons. The next person in this tier at 66th is Dylan from Big Brother Canada 5. He was on the outs for the first few weeks, as he mainly spoke to Emily and Dallas and voted incorrectly on the first vote. Partially because he knew John in real life, he became a parachute for the Bruno, Gavin, Nada side of the house, but he still had a big target on his back. Of course, Emily ended up going home when he was nominated beside her, which was always the plan, but he ended up being pissed off at the people who saved him because Kevin didn't use the veto on either one of them. Things did improve for him after his showman's left, as his target essentially disappeared. He was able to get out the one person who he had no relationship with on his HOH and Cindy, and grew closer with the other newbies to take out the vets and Dimitri. At the same time, he never had a chance to win a jury vote amongst most people, and he was sent home as an FU to Kevin by his closest ally at the time, who was Karen. He really isn't strategic, is okay at some competitions, 
okay socially, and is very emotional, so he's mediocre overall. The next person in this tier at 65th is Bobby from Big Brother Canada 3. A lot of people perceive Bobby to be an idiot, and I don't think that's the case. It's clear that he came in with a strategy to make himself come off as the dumbest person alive, but people didn't really fall for that strategy, and there wasn't a whole lot to do, since he isn't really that smart either. Bobby got into the Top Shop Alliance with Bruno, Greg, Willow, Zach, and Ashley, and I might be missing some people, if I'm to be honest, and had a good relationship with Godfrey, but it was clear that he was the most loyal person to the Alliance and had no options outside of the Alliance, outside of Greg, who got booted early, as he kept on pushing it, even when everyone else had no interest in it. He played extremely passively for the entire season, didn't consider his options, but had to be convinced by the skin of his teeth to vote out Jordan over Godfrey, the latter is someone who he was closer to, and immediately chickened out to kiss up to Zack, who didn't even give a crap about him. Kevin, whom he had no relationship with, targeted him and no one outside of Bruno, and maybe Godfrey cared, though he had that veto lie, which didn't result to too much. Decent in competitions, meddling strategy, and will always get to jury, but struggles to make it to the end game or past early jury on most seasons. The next person in this tier at 64th is Jonathan from Big Brother Canada 11. The more I think about and analyze his run during his season, the worse I feel about him as a player. I will say that he is great socially, and everyone in the season ended up liking him, which will always do him well in Big Brother, but strategically, there's really nothing there at all. He got into the guys' alliance for the first few weeks, and that did blow up, where he ended up on the losing side, but he did nothing to cause that alliance to dismantle. If anything, it helped him be seen as loyal to the rest of the house, so he was able to move into a new alliance called The Crown, where he planned to be loyal to that and wanted to go to the end with people, mainly Koozie that he could very well lose to. Outside of not being good at competitions, he never put himself first in the game and was willing to quit for others not once, but twice. He wanted to sacrifice himself over Roberto, which I forgot about while the scenes was live, and then he asked his alliance to vote him out over Hope in his final week, and I don't see him playing any differently if he were on other seasons or in other environments. The next person in this tier at 63rd is William from Big Brother Canada 5. I think his biggest struggle during his run on Big Brother was the language barrier, where not only is French his first language, but he was not a strong English speaker. In a house where essentially everyone else speaks English, or fluent English, that is going to be a problem, but he luckily had Dre with him that could help him communicate with others better. Without any French speaker, I could see him doing a lot worse in Big Brother. Outside of that, he always talked about wanting to make a big move and to be a strategic player, but he was very mediocre at best in this element, where Aika or Dre had to coach him on what to do and he was willing to backdoor Bruno by burning Kevin, and he saw videoing Kevin as his one chance at a big move. Outside of that, he was very passive in the game, but he was the third best competitor in the house, which will help him on other seasons. In general, he's just very middle of the road. At 67... 62nd is... Gino from Big Brother Canada 10. He is the poster boy for someone who can have all the agency in the world if he just had any sort of foresight or individuality, but actively chooses to not have any agency and it's a huge pushover because he just doesn't have much of a spine in general. Marty told him that he was nominating JC Lynn and he didn't even attempt to convince him to do otherwise. He let Cal completely destroy their alliance of 7 or 8 without trying to stop it or to even attempt to mediate. He let the house talk him into sending home his closest ally on his HOH, and he let the new alliance he was in with Kevin and Hel Helena to talk him into not backdooring Marty when they knew it was a bad idea for Gino. I feel like a lot of people give him chances because he's a mellow, nice dude despite being tattooed to the sky, and also had pretty privilege, since he himself did not offer much strategically, and he was good in comms, but even still, he almost went home during the double due to the mistakes he made, and ended up going home because he didn't refuse to partake in the Gummy Bear game, where he was given an option to not participate. And the final person in this sub tier at 61st is Anika from Big Brother Canada 11. She is someone that ended up surprising people in the season, based on how her preseason interviews went down. Anika said she, she was going to wing it, but she did pick up on the game pretty quickly, as she was persistent with Terrell on using the veto on her, making quick allies with Kuzi and Daniel, and they found themselves in the middle of the house for the first few weeks of the season, where no one was targeting them. Eventually, the crown was formed, and it put them in a majority alliance while having a side deal with the girly pups, which never went anywhere. 
The issue is, it was mainly Kuzi and Daniel making social connections with people outside of the trio, and Anika never really dealt with people outside of her alliance. She was always quick with shutting others down, pertaining strategic advice, because she thought she knew better, but was more often than not wrong. And then there was her HOH, which she really botched, despite making fun of Claudia's HOH, where the same thing happened. I do think she has the ability to learn, but is extremely overconfident. She has some slight potential strategically, but is kind of poor socially and really poor competitively. So this next tier is literally the middle of the middle, so pretty much the most baseline players ever. And the first person in this tier at 60th is Summer from Big Brother Canada 10. I know a lot of people overhyped her before the season even started, and in the first few weeks, she definitely lived up to the hype. Of course, she was in the majority alliance of eight, and started the work for a girl's alliance, and creating her deals outside of the eight, which was impressive. People really liked her, and she was thriving socially, while being the somewhat leader compared to Tanisha and Betty, but people didn't perceive her like that. I think she got too much credit for the cow thing, but it was an example of how she maneuvered, but things completely fell apart for her when Tanisha went home and she never recovered. Everyone started to see her for blatantly throwing competitions, and she cannot regroup in different alliances, and people saw no worth in her, and her campaigning when she was on the block was really, really bad. She isn't a player that does well when she isn't in power, and it just showed that she's a mediocre player overall. The next person in this tier at 59th is JC Lynn from Big Brother Canada 10. She is someone who kind of bumbled their way throughout a lot of the season, since JC Lynn did not know what was happening in the house for a majority of it. It was like whenever she would get into a group, something would cause it to blow up, and she was always on the outs of it, and would have to do damage control. But when JC Lynn ends up on the outs, it's due to her being painfully strict strategically passive, or isolating herself from the house socially. Whenever a revelation happens, she would recover from her mistakes, rebuild some bonds with people, and get more involved in strategy, but she would repeat the same thing over and over, as she would either isolate herself with Gino and or Stephanie. Her final week was probably her best week strategically, where she was really on game mode. If only she was like that the entire season, she would have done a lot better, and she would be a much better player, since she was also good at competitions and was all over the place strategically and socially. I do think that if she were to magically return or to get another chance, I do think she would learn from her mistakes and do a lot better. The next person in this tier at 58th is Ramsey from Big Brother Canada 4. If there is anyone who represented the MOR edgic, especially pertaining to the gameplay, Ramsey would be the poor store child for it. He was in an alliance with Maddie and Ramsey, and somewhat with Levita and Shari, but they quickly became on the outs after the season started. But unlike the other two, he had a pretty solid social game and was not chaotic like the other two, so no one was pissed off at him, except for Cassandra, who was obsessed with him, and no one wanted to target him. At the same time, he never utilized his social game to his advantage, or to create an individualistic game outside of his alliance, and I do remember him being equally obsessed with Cassandra as well. He had a deal with Jared that went nowhere, and he isolated himself with Maddie once he got into a romance with her. Ramsey was able to win to save himself when he needed to, which happened both times he was nominated. And who knows how well he would have done post Maddie had he not quit. The next person in this tier at 57th is Brittany from Big Brother Canada 3. It's clear that many people were not threatened by her initially, and it was why she became a pawn early on, and it takes a lot for certain perceptions to wear off from people. In addition to that, Sarah became her closest ally because Neha was snipped very early on, and Brittany ended up relying on Sarah too much throughout the game, despite her having potential without Sarah. The thing is, she actually had relationships with the Bruno and Bobby side of the house individually from Sarah, and better than Sarah, but she never utilized it outside of the Jordan vote. She was good in h h competitions and took out a lot of key players, but her strategic skill is definitely debatable, especially with the Rillo vote and leaving Ashley off the block, who then won the next h h that would have normally sent her home. In addition to that, she was heavily reliant on twists, as it helped her boot Jordan with Cindy returning and being given information that none of them would have known otherwise, and she got the Takuti top that not only directly saved her from being a 7th placer, but gave her the power to boot Bruno. I just don't think she has the self-interest in her to really thrive to be a better player. At 56th is Jetson from Big Brother Canada 9. It's ironic that I put the co-workers right next to one another. 
Anyways, he is arguably the most scatterbrained person in Big Brother history, or at least what I think based on my immediate memory recall. He got in a relatively solid alliance called the Sunsetters, but he did not do great alliance management with some of the others, causing themselves this distance from self from him and a few of the others. Luckily for him, his side of the house kept on winning HOHs and power, and it took him pretty far into the season. At the same time, he made himself such an obvious target from very early on in the season, and needed competitions so he wouldn't be booted early in addition to his allies, and would do messy things like cause pointless house meetings, make attempted flips, and continuously went back and forth about who to vote out for several weeks. All of this would cause for his own alliance to turn on him, but it would have been off a moot if he just vetoed himself in his final week, and his HOH was extremely messy. He is good at competitions, is okay to good socially, and below average strategically, leaving him to be in the middle of the road. At 55th is Beth from Big Brother Canada 9. Like Jetson, she's also very scatterbrained, but I don't think she's as scatterbrained as he is and didn't make as many stupid mistakes in general. Unlike Jetson, I think her main issue was her social skills, since a lot of the house guests got really annoyed with her from early on and many of them actively disliked her. I do think she utilized her HOH well to take out Victoria, though she was trying to play both sides in the beginning and did it poorly, and it caused her to ruin a lot of relationships. It was good that she always considered her options and wanted to have a separate game from Jetson and Tashan, but she did the same thing that Kayla did and kept on verbalizing it from early on, so when she stuck with them, which made sense for her game, it invalidated her in everyone else's eyes. Despite that, she was a threat to win, as she was all over the place strategically, kind of bad socially, but was decent in competitions. But I do think she is overall not bad, but not good, so she's kind of just here, and I don't think she has any more potential to do better. At 54th is Peter from Big Brother Canada 1. Like I mentioned with Alec, Peter would have done a lot better and been a much stronger player if he didn't try so hard to emulate his gameplay to what Will, Chilltown, and Dan did on their seasons. And whatever the hell the Alliance Dan and Memphis had in BB10 were called. He thought that he needed to be an uber mastermind like they were, despite him not being very good at it, and often made the wrong moves, like targeting Tom prematurely, voting out AJ, and not using the veto on Topaz to vote out Andrew, where Emmett would have been more reliant on him, and he would have had more options. He actually had some good social relationships, and I think I underrated him in this element when I initially covered the season and the players, but he threw a lot of those relationships away because of him trying to be a mastermind and being misted by Emmett over and over again, where they actively told Emmett that they weren't taking him to the final two, so why would he look out for him and Alec? Where the moves gave Emmett the agency that he and Alec could have and should have wanted for themselves. I think he's okay in competitions, relatively good socially, and okay at best strategically, as he's mainly playing a role, but it leaves him as a middle-of-the-road player in my eyes. At 53rd is Alec from Big Brother Canada 1. I feel like he supposedly has all the traits to do very well in the game. Conventionally attractive, has some social skills, has strategic concepts on what to do so he can do well in Big Brother. But based on how he played in BB Can 1, it didn't come together well. He was in the Quattro Alliance, was in a showmatch with Topaz, and was able to slowly bond with people like Enlia and Gary. He could have used those relationships to coast, but he wanted to be the mastermind, but he just wasn't good at it. He actively pushed for Tom to be targeted, which not only weakened his alliance and left him to be more vulnerable, but actively pushed Emmett to the other side and kept Andrew, who was sketched out by him, who he had no relationship with at all over AJ, and it put him on the bottom. In addition to that, he threw the veto when he was on the block in his final week, when he would have won the veto otherwise. I think if he wasn't trying so hard to play like Dan or Will, he could have been a much better player. And the final person in this sub-tier at 52nd is Claudia from Big Brother Canada 11. So, I ended up bumping Claudia up quite a bit, which actually kind of shocked me, but it makes sense that she is kind of in the higher end of the sept tier. I remember everyone thought throughout the season that she was going to move outside of being okay, and she never really did that. She was in a good spot with decent relationships with people, while being shielded by people in her alliance for a majority of the season. She was in a chemance with the biggest shield of the 
season, and she was pretty good in competitions, arguably the second best. Strategically, people were hoping that she would improve, but she never really did, and we saw her make blunder after blunder in the endgame. She was considering to keep Zack, kept on blowing the alliance with the Kuzi Daniel side of the house, and while she had solid relationships with people in the house, it never really built up to anything. It's weird that I don't have much to say about a finalist, especially since she was in the most successful girl alliance in BB history, but she was good at competitions, okay socially, and meh at best strategically. She probably does well on most seasons in not going home early, but I don't see her ever thriving to be a great or even a good player. So this next and final sub-tier of the mediocre tier overall are people who have signs of being solid or potentially being solid players, but they're not really there. And at 51st is Tobas from Big Brother Canada 1. She's someone who I feel like would have done better in a more diverse season and would have thrived in one of the latter seasons. With that said, I think Topaz has a lot of traits to do well. She is very intuitive and knows how to read everyone, and from what we saw, she was pretty strategic with appearing weaker and building relationships with the outsiders without putting her neck out on the line for them. While she could get along with some people, she did have some outbursts which alienated herself from people and came off as pretty aloof at times. Outside of Gary, she did not have ride-or-die alliances, and it came to bite her in the butt when she was going to be in early to mid Jura without the instant eviction HOH that she won, but it just accelerated it. At 50th is Betty from Big Brother Canada 10. Honestly, it is still crazy that there are some people who still hype Betty up mainly for gameplay reasons. From the beginning, she was on the outs, but she did have some decent to good relationships with a few people in the majority 8 alliance at the time. She had a target on her back in the beginning, and people consistently mentioned her name in the first three or so weeks, but got lucky with people like Kyle blowing up their alliances. I will say that she was always willing to make big moves, and to take the shot that needed to be taken, like wanting to take Gina out in the double, and knowing that Kevin was the one who needed to be booted over Helena, and I'm sure they're just pretty much more examples. She's also one of the few people who saw through Kevin from very early on in the season, so she is perceptive at times. At the same time, there were quite a few moments where she played very emotionally, actually a lot of moments where she played emotionally, and was easily convinced to do things that were not in her best interest. I think she's underrated strategically, but mediocre competitively and socially, where she probably does worse in a more stable house strategically. At 49th, is Shania from Big Brother Canada 11. I remember around 9 to 10 months ago, I stated that Big Brother Canada 11 is a fog, and there being no life feeds really caused a lot of the huskies to suffer, and I believe Shanae is one of them. She was obviously a part of the girly pops with Renee and Claudia, which everyone knew about, and it's clear to have a solid alliance. Apparently, she was too focused a lot on the boys and trying to get in a showmance with Roberto or Dan for the first few weeks, which caused the cast to not respect her much as a player, since she was so emotional about it. Apparently, she was the best social player out of the people in her alliance, since she did have a few connections with the other side, especially people like Daniel. A crossover alliance was proposed between them and their partners, which was a good idea, and it seemed like she was the safest throughout the entire season out of her alliance. She did make the move to Vito Renee, and while it was the right move, it cost the house guests to respect her even less, and they never moved on from it, so it did worsen her jury chances, though she made the right move for her game. And then there was a double where her closest ally ended up sacrificing her to go home, since Claudia's showman betrayed her and wanted Shania gone. At 48th is Heather from Big Brother Canada 2. Obviously, her early season was very messy and outward poor in many elements. The first reason is that she was doing very poorly socially, and the worst part of it was that she was well-intentioned, but everyone thought that she was fake, annoying, cut out, and they wanted nothing to do with it or her. It caused for her to be on the block quite a few times during the early weeks, and she does eventually get into a better position, but it was nothing of her own doing. It was due to Canada's HOH and the other nominees self-imploding even more, and Canada's HOH encouraging people on who to work with and who to not work with. When she is in the sloppy seconds, she was decently positioned and her social game did improve, while showing that she did want to make moves. At the same time, she didn't see that her allies were coming for her at the end game, and that lack of awareness makes it easy for her to be blindsided in other situations. She also didn't know that she was being targeted in Ica's HOH overall. 
At 47th is Gary from Big Brother Canada 1 and 5. One of the main reasons why he is on this tier is because he was voted out in the early jury portion of the season, and it was done fair and square as well. He didn't have many allies in the season, and his closest allies left early, where he was only left with Topaz when he was eventually evicted. He wasn't playing a good game by this point, and was mainly only good in competitions. He then was given the grace to return in a vote, where producers knew he would win over the other making the final four into the final five, where he was able to skip two weeks and three rounds of gameplay. He was able to get Emmett to work with him, and it caused him to stay over Andrew, though he won the veto that week anyways. Dan had to convince him to boot Emmett, and then he accidentally lost the season due to Topaz voting incorrectly. Good at comps, meh at everything else in general, as he was all over the place socially, as he can be fun, but can be cranky, and kind of isolates himself at times, and needed to be heavily guided strategically, and as we have seen, he usually would place around the mid portion of the season. So, Gary's run in BB Can 5 is definitely an interesting one, and I am definitely more lenient on him because of all the preseason drama that affected his run during the season. The first thing is that Gary was not close to many, if any, of the veterans that were put on the season with him. I think Emmett not being on the season due to contractual reasons really hurt him in this regard, and he isn't close with many alumni either. There was also the sideshow wardrobe drama that happened with him and Netta, where which he apparently started, and the two of them never got over it. In the season, he definitely went out of his way to be more social and wanted to be a strategic advisor for the newbies, which I do think is a, strat is a smart strategy. He unknowingly started the downfall of Cassandra, which weakened his position, and he didn't realize that he was running out of numbers until it was too late. But he was taken out due to the stupid backwards week, where if the result of the competitions of that week was still the same, he wouldn't have been in danger at all, based on who won HOH. At 46 is Nick from Big Brother Canada 4. He's one of the biggest question marks in BB history, just like many people who played as two people, and the other examples also include BBUS, and I'm referring to both sets of twins. Despite the fact that we will never see him on his own, and he was a lot less familiar with Big Brother compared to his brother, it caused him to follow his brother around, though he has more of the skills to do better at Big Brother on his own. Nick was very good in competitions, which always benefits people, especially in Big Brother Canada, where competitions matter a lot more. He also had a decent read on the house and his instincts, but he started doubting himself partially due to his brother telling him to, and partially due to his lack of familiarity with the game overall. And it was his idea to essentially quit and to be nominated on their own HOH because Cassandra tricked them. Despite being good at comps and not being as chaotic as his brother, I don't know what else about him is solid or anything above where I have him now. At 45th is Erica from Big Brother Canada 6. Now that we are at a point where we're discussing people who are at least decent players, it's not shocking that the remaining ones are the pre-jurors who lasted the longest, and their placement would put them as jurors in most seasons. The first and only person on this tier is Erica, and while she was screwed like the other people I've yet to talk about, I do think as a player, she's definitely the weakest. Erica is a competition beast, and it is definitely something that will benefit her in most seasons, and she was definitely a pretty good social player as well. Most of the house liked her, and she was working with half of the house, and the other half of the house wanted to work with her. She definitely has an issue with threat management, and I do think she is less than stellar strategically, as she went after people who wanted to work with her, and were absolutely no threats to her, but kept around a group of people who weren't working together and were actively targeting her. And all she did was build her own target. I do see her doing decently well on most of the seasons. At 44th is Terrell from Big Brother Canada 11. I believe he's the first sole winner on this list. I'm not including the brothers in that. And it makes absolute sense. He was in a good position at first, since he was in a guy's alliance and had other connections with people in the house. Unfortunately, that doesn't last long because of his need to make her manage everyone and how easily jealous he gets of others, while enabling Zack, who is becoming more and more of a liability. In addition to that, he was extremely close to quitting because things weren't going his way for the first time in the season. From that point onwards, he was on an island by himself and acted like he had nothing to do with it, but luckily for him, he was great in competitions. Not only was he able to win himself to the end from the halfway point essentially, but his competition wins essentially scared the endgamers 
into working with him and to not target him afterwards, since he would save himself and use his competition wins to make cutthroat moves. I think he's very inconsistent socially, great at competitions, and is a mixed bag strategically, and if he was less messy, I would consider him a solid player. But because he won the way he did, and he doesn't really seem that self-reflective, I could easily see him doing the same thing if he was on another season, but doing worse. And the final person in the sub tier and tier overall at 43rd is Kevin from Big Brother Canada 3 and 5. As we all know, BB Can can be extremely inaccurate with some of their edits, and Kevin from BB Can 3 is the biggest example of this. They portrayed him as some sort of mastermind throughout the season because production liked him in the diary room compared to some others, but he was not a mastermind in the slightest in reality. Most of the house actively distrusted him, which is why he was nominated in the first few weeks of the game, and it was his veto wins that saved him from potentially going home on both rounds. He has a one-sided final two with Jordan, who kept him on a need-to-know basis and was on an island with his future wife, Pilar, but those relationships eventually caused him to be a part of the diaper alliance with Zack and Ashley, who won many of the mid-game HOHs. He thought that getting rid of Bobby was a sexy and big move, and continuously underestimated Brittany, which ended up biting him in the butt during the triple, where she targeted him, and Bruno, as well as his own alliance, did not find it worthy enough for him to be saved. Meh at best social game, meh at best strategic game, good in competition, and makes jury on most seasons, but struggles after early jury. But in general, I think that they are very similar to one another, as he found himself in a dominant slash majority alliance, which lasted a lot longer, but he wasn't making relationships with anyone outside of it other than William, and only really dealt with Cindy, Netta, and Bruno within the alliance. His alliance fell apart, and due to a lack of social relationships, he essentially had nowhere to go outside of competition wins, and he was able to win out from about the final eight onwards, if I remember correctly. And it was solely due to competitions, since he studied before the season even started. Wasn't strong strategically, met at best socially, and great competitively, but he wasn't as out of the loop as he was on his first season, so there's some slight improvement. As we've seen, he'll make it through the pre-jury pretty easily, but struggles once the jury phase starts. So now we're moving on to the solid tier, and these are people who are officially in the higher tiers, or they're one of the upper tier players, but they're not the best of the best, and they're still pretty flawed. But overall, they have more positives than negatives, hence them being here, and will probably do well on a majority of the seasons that they do, if they're randomly thrown in any season. So the first person in this tier overall, and in the sub tier, that I like to call that are people who I can debate or are debatable about potentially moving into the mediocre tier. So the first person fitting this at 42nd is Jordan from BB Can 3. He's a prime example of someone who made a really bad move, which deserves to be criticized and penalized, but it doesn't mean that they are a bad player and don't have skills to do well in BB. He had a very strong alliance with Zack, where they were in the middle of a lot of their alliances in the house, and had a lot of control throughout the first few weeks of the season. Of course, he was closer to the nerdier and super fan side of the house, while he also had good relationships with the chop shop side of the house. He was very good socially. He bounced off well with Zack strategically, but he volunteered to be nominated so he could hide the alliance with Zack that everyone knew about because he ran into Zack's arms after he won the HOH and threw the veto, which caused him to go home. He shouldn't have ever put himself in that position, though there's the argument that he would have been safe if it wasn't for the twist of Cindy returning and her having information from the preachers that she otherwise wouldn't have gotten. The next person at 41st is Herman from BB Can 10. On most seasons, he would have done a lot better, since his ideal strategy worked for a lot of people. His goal was to set up a big alliance full of the threats, where they all stick together, and he's at the epicenter of the group. The issue for Herman is, this season did not support that type of alliance structure, as it was a more fluid house. He set up his structure with winning the first HOH, and was able to maintain a lot of these relationships when the majority alliance started falling. The Issue with Harmon is that he can never let this idea go and cannot adapt to the more fluid house where people 
he saw as floaters like Kevin and Helena were playing in several alliances and were running the house, as they were able to convince Marty, who Hermione made a deal with, and he was planning on backstepping anyways, to break their deal and to send him home. He was good in competitions and was good strategically, but his lack of flexibility is why he is here. The next person, and the second to last pre draw on this list, in general, at 40th, is Sarah from BB Can 2. So just based on how I ranked the house guests and the amount of time she lasted on her season, it's no shock that she's pretty much at the top of the list, in addition to 10th placers being jurors on most seasons. Of course, I'm going to mention her getting blatantly screwed with Canada's HOH, and unlike Andrew, she herself was in no danger at that point to be targeted. Obviously, she was in the first five alliance, where she is a key member, and she also had good relationships with most of the house, as she was a part of the girls' alliance, and even the outsiders did not mind her. While I do think that the paw move was a mistake, she recovered from it brilliantly, and it showed that she's able to clean up messes not only for herself, but for her allies. And there was her hugging Kenny once he won the veto, showing to everyone, especially Arlie, how close they were, but she was probably going up and out at the backup anyways. I feel good about her as a player, and her ability to do well if she were to make it far in most seasons, or in other seasons. At 39th is Tina from BB Can 9. I feel like she was really set up well, as she was in the Sunsetters Alliance, but wasn't the face of it, and had good relationships with people who are not in that alliance. She started flipping on them in week 2, where she slapped the Wuhan boot, and completely flipped on them in the third week, once she was recruited in the alliance with the other side. Tina was somewhat of a floater between the two alliances, as she maintained relationships with both, but it became clear that she became very lazy and complacent in her position with Terra as the game started being played around her. And in her final week, when Kiefer was put up, she essentially didn't campaign and knew that there was a chance she was in danger, but she didn't do anything to circumvent it. Tina was great in the beginning, and while she wasn't good in competitions, she did not capitalize on her other strengths as the season went on. At 38th is our final pre drawer is Kenny from BB Can 2. Even when I was making the BB Can 2 game player's tiers list, I was going back and forth whether he or Sarah should be higher, but I decided to put him higher, but I could easily be talked into switching them. He was very much a key and central role in the success of the first five alliance, and drove the strategy with Sarah and to a lesser extent early the entire time. He was good in competitions from what I remembered, and a lot of the house guests did like him, so that wasn't a problem socially, though that would decrease once he glued himself to Andrew. Of course, there was him pretending to be straight so he can manipulate the woman with flirting, which, the less said, the better. Of course, he was screwed by Kenneth's HOH, and the first five did have the advantage over the house at that point in the season, but Andrew was always going to be the main target. His biggest issue is the threat management, but he's definitely one of the few P-Jurors I can easily state is good, and his placement would put him as a Jura in most seasons. At 37th is Arlie from BB Can 2. He was a few spots higher, but had to be moved on just because didn't really feel like he should be there. He was in the first five alliance and was able to build some good bonds with people outside of it, like John and Adele which is why he was never portrayed as negatively as some of his other allies in the alliance. He played up the class clown image and threw a decent amount of competitions in the beginning. Arnie was placed really well, but saw that he needed to completely turn on the first five when Canada nominated Andrew and Sabrina. Completely wiping them out wasn't a good move for him, since it didn't keep him in the middle and gave Netta and John all of the agency. He was one of the few who saw through Netta, I made a very good pitch to have Sabrina, Allison, and Rachel keep him after John backstepped him. I think he has all the tools to do well, but needs to be a le bit less eager, and I think he would have been great. At 36 is Kuzi from BB Can 11. So she was arguably the best social player of the season, at least for the first two thirds of the season, and it's why many of the house guests respected and liked her. Kuzi was in the perfect middle position with Daniel and Anika for the first few weeks of the season, but she ended up giving it up when she won HOH because not only did she want to make a big move, but she also didn't like how Zack was playing the game and season so far. What happened was that it forced her to not only be shielded by others, but she became the shield for her alliances, and she ended up giving that middle position to the girly pops. Luckily for her, she formed the Crown Alliance, and the girly pops screwed up the middle position. 
Things start falling apart not only for her alliance, but for her when Hope volunteers to go on the block, which caused her to lose Jonathan, then Hope in the next week, and then her allies threw her under the bus at the perfect time for her to take the hit over at them. I think she was not the best strategically and should have worked with shields like Santina, only working with Ty in her final week when she should have worked with him earlier, and arguably Zack and Roberto, but became the shield herself, and her gameplay wasn't good enough to handle that. Despite that, she was the biggest story threat in the entire season, and was great social. And the final person in the sub tier at 35th is Jared from BB Can 4. People in his archetype generally do well, and it's not shocking that Jared ended up playing similarly, but to a lesser extent. While I do think that a lot of his success in the game is due to privilege, take that however you want, over skill, he still has some decent skills. He is relatively solid strategically, though he isn't as messy as Kelsey and not horrible like Raul, and had the best social game out of his alliance, but he was still relatively kickish with his alliance and with the house in general, and made his alliance way too obvious, where it did alienate people. He was good in competitions, which definitely helped him, but he had the sanctimonious vibe to him that caused him to think emotionally at times, and he made himself such a huge threat, which shows a huge fault in his threat management. Solid in most or all facets of Big Brother, but not good or great in any of them. So, the next sub tier is people who I'm calling above average but are still a bit too flawed, and the first person in this tier at 34th is Joel from BB Can 4. It's interesting how so many people were hyping him up when the season was airing and soon after it ended. But it seemed like many people in the BB Can fanbase forgot about him and his gameplay. He was of course in the middle floater group and had solid relationships with everyone in the house, so he was floating pretty strongly, though he was heavily guided by the others in the middle group. It wasn't until he won HOH in the fourth week where he really chose a side, but he got no backlash for it. He went back under the radar after this, and after Mitchell left, he stuck with Tim and Cassandra, where they all took over the house and were planning on going to the finals with one another. The issue was that they weren't good at competitions, and while he was planning on sticking loyal to them in the final five, he didn't handle the situation very well, and in general he didn't have much agency or foresight for his own agency, as he completely crumpled when he was on the block. I think he is good socially and competent strategically, but isn't strong in competitions and crumbles due to the lack of killer instinct. At 33rd is Alejandra from BB Can 6. She was someone who surprised me while we watching the season. While I did know that she wasn't a bad player, she was definitely more insulated than I thought and was key in a lot of situations in the early to mid season. Socially, Alejandro was pretty good, but not the greatest, and while I do think she was good strategically for the most part, she got very messy and it caused her to lose trust within people in her own alliance and made her extremely vulnerable as well as expendable, and she made quite a few slip-ups by the end. In addition to Alejandro being very poor at competitions and not being good at campaigning, she is only in this tier instead of a higher tier, but she knew how to position herself and also worked with good allies that brought out the best in her. At 32nd is Cassandra from BB Can 4 and 5. She is someone who has a lot of fun playing the game, and because she is enjoying herself so much, you can just not help but get invested in the way she's playing the game. Cassandra was of course in the middle group, but she was also closer to the trio side due to knowing Jung in real life and also liking Kelsey, compared to the Dallas side of the house. Cassandra was trying to build something with Levita, one of the reasons why Shari was booted instead, but it got her on the block, but luckily her bonds caused her to stay in the house. She did get very close to Tim, and they became a duo as the season took place, but the middle group started disintegrating during the Maddie vote, where she did lose that war and was a target from that point onwards. Kelsey coming back and booting Mitchell helped her more than she probably even realized at the time, since it put herself, Joel, and Tim in a power position again, and they let the Maddie vs. Kelsey side's war take place for the next few weeks. Of course, there was her HOH where she took out Jared. While it was a good move, it also earned her a lot of ire from some of the house guests. Cassandra has a way of making amends with people and drawing them in, even after she had already stabbed them in the back. She was a threat to win in the season, but she definitely had her sloppy moments, which is why she's not higher on the top 10 list. She isn't lower because she came in on a returning season where there's a lot of outside circumstances, like most of the alumni not liking BB Can 4 and some of them specifically not liking her. 
Despite being in the quote-unquote veterans alliance, she mentioned in anger that she would back Renetta. She was not close to the BB Kenzie crew at all, who she was actively targeting. Gary almost flipped on her over a misunderstanding, and the other veterans saw her as expendable. It didn't help that a lot of the newbies didn't care for her, and she couldn't form bombs with people because she was a game bot, and thought that her strategy from the prior season was okay and was a replicable one. She was able to get some people by the end of her stay, but it was too late and refused to adapt from her prior season, but was more obsessed with how social media would perceive her. At 31st is Bruno from BB Ken 3 and 5. One of the main reasons why he ended up this high is because he was blatantly twist screwed in the coup d'etat, where he would have lasted at least a little bit further in the game without it. Of course, he got into the Chop Shop Alliance, which was definitely the most solid alliance at the time, and he was clearly the main strategic force in the alliance, but people didn't really use it as a reason to target him. He was able to win HOH, or the HOH that saved the alliance a bit after Greg was booted, and he had some relationships with people outside of the alliance, mainly Brittany, that avoided him being nominated for a while. I will say that he was saved with Cindy returning since Zack was intending on backdooring him, but that clearly did not happen. He and Bobby gave up their middle spots after this, which I think was personally very dumb, but he did start getting closer to Zack, causing him to veto him in the triple, and was able to adapt more with using Zack as a shield. We do see that he has a temper and can be a bit off at times, which is why he after being screwed out of BB Can 3, I think many people were hoping that he would thrive in the season, like he previously would have done so in his other season without being screwed out, which unfortunately didn't happen. He and Kevin organized a sloppy last minute attempt to save Mark, which ended up backfiring on the both of them and caused people to distrust him to some extent for the rest of the season. Luckily for him, Aika was able to get Dimitri to overlook Bruno just voting him out and was able to join a new alliance of six. He was able to build a solid relationship with people outside of them, with Dylan, Emily, and Jackie, but he ended up burning all three of them by showing how expendable they were to him, and his game never recovered, in addition to the other newbies just in general not caring for him. Things fell apart after Cindy targeted Neda, and he didn't have the numbers to overcome it, as well as losing Cindy afterwards. We saw a hint of what was a problematic element to his game in BB Ken 3, but it was a lot worse here, where he got very emotional and upset when things didn't go his way, and he wasn't adaptable at all in this season. At 30th is Andrew from BB Can 1. It is very fitting that he is next, since he is another person who just lacks the killer instinct. I do think that he was good socially, and was rather simplistic. He was solid strategically as well, while holding his own against Jemit in the competitions very well. He was not in any defined alliance from what I could understand mainly early on in the season, outside of something with AJ, though he was building bonds with a bunch of other people, which would definitely help him once the jury portion started. It caused him to be safe when Topaz targeted him, and the East Coast Alliance was then formed, which also helped with them winning all the HOHs from that point onwards, essentially. He knew that he would get cut third over Jemit, but wanted to take them to the end, and thought a lot less of people who didn't play like he did. It doesn't seem like he's someone who would learn how to play differently, even if how he played isn't working out or didn't work out. So that's why he is here. At 29th is Sarah from BB Can 3. And she's another winner who barely made it above the halfway point and the upper half of this list, and it really adds up once you break down her game. While there were several alliances in the early parts of the season, most of them didn't even make it onto the show because there were that many. The only ones that really held on were herself, Neha, Johnny, and Brittany, and she was closer to the other two than Brittany in the beginning. She kept on losing allies during the first few weeks of the season, but luckily her relationships with Zack and Jordan kept herself and Brittany safe during the early portion. Until Cindy returns. Not only is she given information that she wouldn't have been privy to otherwise due to the pre-Jora spilling info to one another about Zack and Jordan playing the house. And then she boots Jordan, someone who wanted to work with her, over Godfrey, who never aligns with her in the season, and then ends up being the one vote to evict Willow accidentally in the triple because she overthought things. And then there was the coup that didn't leave her allyless in the final seven and brought her pair with her to the final four. 
She wasn't good in competitions, was great socially, and was a mess strategically, but she was resilient, always worked on relationships, has the ability to acknowledge and learn from her mistakes. At 28, is Stray from BB Ken 5. I already spoke about her in the prior video, and I'm going to add it in my prior comments here. For someone who was in a mixed season, meaning that the newbies in general were not only set up to fail, but to be overshadowed in all facets, Dre doing as well as she did really showed how good of a player she is. Dre laid under the radar for the first few weeks and was able to make bonds with Ika and Cassandra, and through them, had other allies. She was not playing as poorly as many of the other newbies, but the fact that she was not close to the Bruno Aneta side of the house caused her to be nominated in the first week, and she was set up to be a mid-season boot. Luckily for her, the sixth alliance is destroyed, and while she is told about this alliance, she puts herself in the position where the veterans were going after one another, and the newbies were pinning them against one another, where they sat in the middle and she was in the top position. She remained in this position for a few weeks before she started being caught for double dealing. She's good strategically and was good socially, especially as the season went on, but competitions was a problem and she lacked subtlety. At 27th is Willow from BB Ken 3. She's definitely a weird one, since Will was always well positioned for her, essentially the entire season, before she was quickly and swiftly evicted, which was an accident, actually. Willow was in the Chop Shop Alliance, so she had good relationships with them throughout the entire season, even when that alliance officially ended. And even then, she had good relationships with, of course, Sarah, and a lot of other good relationships with people not in that alliance. Positionality-wise, Willow was doing great, and while she is definitely not great strategically, she was fine enough, but of course she was poor in competitions. I think the fact that she was too screwed is why I put her higher, as she would have been an endgamer in the season otherwise, and she most likely does very well in most seasons, with a decent amount of jury votes as well. And at 26, the final person in the sub-tier is Brayden from BBCan9. He was extremely passive in the season, and was too focused on hanging out with his friends, but he never made too many mistakes, and didn't have a target on him. He was glued to Austin, and while, and when he got himself into an alliance with half of the house, that relationship caused for him to be distant from the alliance, so poor alliance management's there, and they're split up at the end of the pre-jury. But once she did leave, Brayden started to improve a lot in the game. He was making connections with many people in the house, started dropping tidbits of information here and there, and started to somewhat float afterwards, before really getting close to Tishan near the end. I do think he got better strategically, socially, and competitively during the second half of the season, but he had a really bad start, and I don't know if he has the instincts to be a better player. So the final sub-tier in the solitaire overall are people who can easily grow to be stronger players on future seasons, and the first person in this sub-tier at 25th is Olivia from BBCan6. I didn't see much difference between herself and Alejandra when I was watching the season live back in 2018, but their differences are a lot clearer now. I will say that her social game was definitely worse in the beginning, especially since she really didn't deal with people not in her alliance. Things for her definitely improved regarding the entire house socially after the first few weeks, and she maintained that, but she always had good relationships with her alliance. She booted out the one person who was gunning for her, and who had no relationship with her in Hamza, and she wasn't targeted for the rest of the season essentially. Definitely a lot better than I thought before this rewatch. At 24th, it's Helena from BB Can 10. I think Helena is someone who generally has great instincts for the game and knows the moves that needs to be made. She knew that she wasn't going to be good in the competitions and knew that she was unthreatening, so she could somewhat float and put herself in a position where all the sides of the house needs her for a vote. And because of that, she could kind of somewhat control what was happening. She pretty much always knew what was happening in the house and laid low while making strong connections with certain people. The issue is, the respect was never really there in those relationships, so when she did decide to turn on Tanisha, that side of the house never forgave her for it, and that she was emotional as well as a scatterbrained follower. The main issue is, that when you consistently push yourself as a non-threat, people will start to believe it, and it doesn't help that when she had competition wins, her two videos, she did nothing with it, and people just simply liked Kevin more in comparison. She was booted in the final four, despite being the weaker threat at the end game, and the jury really hated her, because she had poor jury management. Her goodbye message to JC Lynn was horrendous. 
She has the skills, but lacks the nuances and smoothness to be in a higher tier, and the only strong category for her is being strategic. At 23rd is Daniel from BB Ken 11. It's really sad that the best end gamer from BB Ken 11 didn't even make it to the top 20 of this list. Anyways, Daniel was one of the few people on the season to be a super fan, and that definitely helped him with how to play and navigate the game, compared to most of his other house guests. He laid low for the first few weeks, didn't make himself a target, and built relationships with people in the house before deciding on the alliance that he would work with, which many people in the season didn't do. Of course, the crown was formed, and they had a good two-week run of dominance, I guess, but even within the alliance, he didn't have much influence in it, as they consistently made bad move after bad move, which he tried to prevent, but none of them just listened to him. From this point onwards, his game was mainly about self-preservation, and he did a good job at that while building good relationships with people. The issue is, he couldn't win a competition when he needed to, and couldn't take control of the game to change it in the direction that benefits him the most. At 22nd is Aika from BBCan2 and 5. Based on her BBCan2 game, she was absolutely horrendous. From what it was portrayed, her attitude caused her to be nominated in the first week, but she was a pawn, wasn't in danger of going home, and that might have been an inaccurate edit anyways. But it was clear that she was on the outs and never put in the work to get herself out of it. She was aligned with the caddy girls, but when you are aligned with caddy girls over being caddy, you can't be shocked when the caddy behavior backfires on you, which ends up happening here. She had people in the first five who were really mad at her and actively targeting her, where most of the house just didn't care about her. She won HOH and she had the chance to make other allegiances, target the people who were targeting her, and put herself in a better position, but she did everything she shouldn't do on an HOH. She alienated the few allies she did have on an HOH with picking fights, didn't target the people who were coming after her, put up two pawns, one of them being a horrible pawn, and the other one she was targeting due to personal reasons, and her target ended up staying in the house. Yikes. I'm going to state it now. She is one of the 10 people given a chance to return in BB Ken history. So I do hold that against her, and it's not as impressive as dominating on your first time. I gave a warning while ranking the BB Ken Endgamers that she would not make it to the top 10, and she didn't make it to the top 20 here. With that out of the way, her game was extremely impressive with how she was able to be in the middle of the Neda Bruno side of the house and the Cassandra side of the house in the first few weeks of the season. She knew that it was not worth saving some people, but also knew that she would have to strike against the side when the time came, which is what she did when the double eviction came around. Aika had the bond with several of the newbies in the house, and was able to have a ride or die in Dimitri, who won competitions, so when they were targeted from that week onwards, they were able to convince people to keep whomever else was on the block, and completely outplayed most of the vets when they weren't HOH. When she found out that Dre was potting against her, that was squashed and handled within a day as Dre was booted. The thing she couldn't prepare for was Kevin's competition run, and while she had a good moment socially, she also had a really rough moment, and she wasn't going to win against many people in the end, and she was perfectly fine with giving up her game so Dimitri could win and advance. She did improve on some of her faults from her first season, mainly on strategy, but got weaker in other elements, like competition wins. In general, I do think Aika is a very inconsistent player. At 21st is Jillian from BB Ken 1. It's interesting rewatching BB Ken 1 when you realize that she became Emmett's number 1 based on default, due to Tom getting booted early on. It seemed like she was close with Liza, but the latter threw her under the bus and while she wasn't doing poorly socially, she wasn't in any notable alliances at the time, but because of who she was attached to and her being a strong competitor, people left her alone. Luckily for her, things changed to the point where Emmett had to work with her as a number one, and she definitely had the instincts for the game, with willing to being cutthroat and making the moves she needed to make, which she showed in her second HOH, where she broke her word to Alec and Topaz in a cutthroat manner. The East Coast Alliance was great for her, since it had the three best competitors in an alliance, where both Andrew and Emmett were taking care to the end over one another. At the same time, her jury management was horrendous. She got outplayed by Emmett several times in the season, except for the one time where she didn't fold on his request to keep Peter, and would whine about and to the jurors about not being respected. 
and the biggest factor is that she wasn't supposed to win the season. And the final person, not only just in this up tier, but this tier overall, at 20th is Josh from BB Ken 10. I do think that Josh has the skills to be a good or a great player if he nourished his skills more and if he was more of a fan of the game and show. People are naturally drawn to him, and he had this aura that caused people to want to work with him and caused for everyone in the house to work with him. He was aware of this, but never actively used it to his advantage, where he could have used these social relationships to not only keep himself safe, which was done in week 3, but not afterwards, but to really control the information flow of the house and to take over the season. He was very good in competitions, where he was second or third in every competition he played in, which caused him to dominate the end game comps when the bigger competitors were gone, so I do think he's one of the best competitors in BB Can history, due to that consistency. In addition to that, he had a solid read on what was happening in the house, but he was essentially in most of the major alliances that took place in the season. The issue is, people thought they were closer to him than he perceived to be, or he perceived them to be, and he never really controlled that perception, so it caused a lot of the jurors to be really mad at him, and it didn't help that he ended up playing Kevin's game as the season came to a close, when he could have taken Helena to the end so he could win, and put allies who were more loyal to him that he put more in jeopardy, though those same allies he could beat at the end in the vote. He was able to stay in the final five when he was set to go, so that is impressive. I don't know if he's the type who can actually learn from his mistakes to do better. So we are finally at the good tier, and these are very good players who would do well on the most seasons since they have pretty much all or close to all the skills necessary to be a good, efficient, and a consistent Big Brother player. They are only here and not in the top tier because they do have a few notable flaws and and or just simply aren't the best of the best. So this first tier are for people who easily could be moved to the solid tier, but I found them to be a bit less flawed than the people in the solid tier in comparison. And the first person in this tier, who I am the most iffy on pertaining which tier to put him on, at 19th is Tishan from BBCan9. The more and more time I get for my initial ranking of BB Can 9 cast, the more and more unsure I feel about him being in this tier. He did get into a solid Sunsetter alliance, who did position themselves pretty well at first, but there was poor alliance management, where people perceived that there was a hierarchy, so it caused people like Tina to flip. After Latoya left the house, half of the house were planning on targeting him and Judson, mainly the latter, and his side had to win the next several HOHs for him to be in a good position again. While he was definitely scatterbrained, he was a lot less scatterbrained than Beth and Judson, and built better relationships, while the other two ended up isolating themselves as the weeks went on. While he did set up his endgame correctly, which is an underrated skill, he didn't care about jury management at all and mainly benefited from using the shield strategy at the endgame. He can win competitions when he wants or needs to, has a pretty solid grasp of social skills and strategy, but is kind of messy, which is why he's at the very bottom of this tier. At 18th is Derek from BBCan6. He is someone who knew absolutely nothing about Big Brother, and it's clear that he mainly just wanted to bro down with Jesse and Will the entire season initially. That was thwarted when Jesse was prematurely booted, and sometimes your closest ally going home early benefits you in the long run, which it did benefit him, since he had to make other relationships and had to learn about the game from Kayla. The Red Room Alliance had all the control in the early portion of the season, but the entire house started targeting him and Kayla in the mid-portion of the season, and they booted Mirren because of it. But like Tishan, he made it to the end mainly because he and Kayla had to win the next several HOH and Rita competitions. But they were able to realign with Alejandra and Olivia, as well as the trio, where they were able to stay when both were on the block, but he had to win the veto to do it. He started to have better social relationships than Kayla as the season came to an end, and was able to trick well in the final five, which is why he became the biggest jury threat at the endgame. I think he's someone who learns as he goes, is inoffensive enough, good at competitions, and has a solid social game, but he's never as great or has a moment of being great as the others, and I don't know how well he would do if he wasn't with Kayla. At 17th is Zach from BBCan3. 
Now that I'm thinking about it, he is one of the most twist screwed people in BB Can history, but the thing that makes him stand out is that he was twist screwed by more than one twist. He was in a great position for the first half of the season, where he was in the Chop Shop Alliance, though he was nowhere close to being lured to it, but they weren't aware of that, and had relationships with the other side of the house as well. With him being partnered with Jordan and them working both sides of the house, everything essentially went through them, and they controlled what got back to whom, and who would end up going home. No one was catching on to the game until the returnee twist happened, where the pre-jurors were sequestered and were allowed to compare notes, where they released himself and Jordan were running the house. He and Jordan made a series of dumb moves in that week, and he got scared of the twist to rectify that mistake, which ended up costing him his closest ally. Despite that catastrophic week, Zack was able to actually recover. He played with his diaper alliance that won the next few HOHs, was playing very openly compared to being behind the scenes like beforehand, and was able to make it several rounds despite being targeted and the biggest shield ever, while also avoiding the twists of the triple and the coup d'etat. I feel like in a season without twists, he would do amazing. He's great socially, solid strategically, though he's good when he's working with certain people, and knows when to win and throw competitions, but his lack of threat management is arguably his biggest fault. At 16th is Godfrey from BB Can 3. He is someone that I get more and more confused about the more time goes on, and I have to sit on his journey throughout the season. He was able to lay low, and as a black man with his physique slash build, that is an extremely impressive feat. But he did this because he apparently was overplaying in the first week, and it built a target on his back, so he had to rectify it. Godfrey was close to the Chop Shop Alliance, while never actually being in the Alliance, and would appear to make himself weaker, which caused for no one to target him in the first few weeks. He was the pawn that ended up being the target due to Zack's HOH, or during Zack's HOH due to the twist, and the latter not to wanting to backdoor Bruno, which would have been bad for Godfrey. Of course, he then used his speeches as a strategy to make it clear who he was targeting, and people felt comfortable keeping him around, because they all knew he was going after Zack. And then he played both sides of the house for the rest of the season, and was very aware of the position he was in. The issue is, he didn't explain his game well enough to the jury, so they really thought that he did nothing, and it affected his jury chances. Especially when he chose the wrong person to go to the final two with, in Sarah instead of Ashley. I do think he could pull a similar strategy, or even grow from what he did on this season, as he improved socially and strategically while comps weren't his thing, though he did throw quite a bit, and it'll be interesting to see if he was able to do the same strategy, but make it more visible to the jurors in another season or scenario. At 15th is Kayla from BB Can 6. She's most definitely an interesting person to talk about. Kayla got herself into a four-person alliance with Jesse, Paris, and Derek, but that didn't end up lasting long, but she didn't sink with the ship like the other two, despite them all ironically making to the final three. There was somewhat of an alliance with the Red Room, and it benefited all of them for a while, where she had good relationships with all of them but Johnny, and she was able to talk herself from being nominated on Hamza's HOH. The relationship between Alejandra and Olivia became an inconsistent thing during the early to mid weeks, but they were able to repair it soon afterwards. Her target grew during the Marin Voda week, where he was sent home due to getting close with herself and Derek. From this point onwards, she and Derek were heavily reliant on competitions and was able to throw it a twist that was supposed to screw her, which is Canada's veto. She and Derek ended up using the trio and Ali and Olivia to accomplish their goals over the next few weeks and fought off Johnny going after them, where she was able to survive the block against Alejandra and Johnny was finally defeated. Despite being the leading strategist of the pair, she was li less liked in comparison to Derek and she was not only seen as a complete game pot while having a contentious relationship with the first juror and Ryan and consistently mentioning that she would cut Derek and angering the jury when she didn't do so. I do feel like there are some social holes in her gameplay that have her not excel to the great, or even being higher on this specific tier. And the final person in the sub tier at 14th is Ashley from BB Can 3. It's interesting how Ashley is almost always overlooked, though I think out of all the women in BB Can, I would have the most confidence and faith in her consistently doing well. She was brought into the Chop Shop Alliance, and it wasn't due to her affiliation with Zack, and while she wasn't very loyal to them, she wanted to keep them in her back pocket, and made allegiances with people like Pilar. I think the only one who didn't care for her early on was Brittany, who wasn't even targeting her 
per se, and she was very under the radar. She was very instrumental in forming the Diaper Alliance, since she had many ethnic connections that brought the five of them together, which included Zack and Jordan, and was the most strategic person in that alliance. It wasn't Zack whose reads became more inconsistent after Jordan left, but unfortunately only Pilar listened to her in that alliance. She started winning when she needed to, which is an important skill, remained calm when she was blatantly twist screwed on her HOH, and was able to get through the triple eviction that should have cut half of her numbers, and remained calm when the coup happened. She was a threat to win at the end, and I think she is very well rounded, but the agency isn't the strongest, which is why she is here. And the inability to really get people to listen to her, even if what she's saying is correct. So this next up here are people who are standard good players, but there's an essence of them that is missing that is holding them from being potentially great. And the first person in this tier at 13th is Paris from BB Can 6. I struggled a lot with her when rewatching and analyzing the season, since it reminded me of the bloated edit she got compared to how she was on the feeds. Strategy is definitely not her strongest suit, since she's extremely scatterbrained and did not have agency, meaning that she couldn't utilize her strategy for a majority of the season, as she tried to convince people to keep quite a few of the pre jurors but no one bit. In that case, she is like Ashley, who is right below her. I will say that she is one of the better social people in the season, as she really did speak to everyone, built bonds with them, and made them feel good when they were on their way out of the house. And while they knew she could be somewhat two-faced, they never saw it as her being mean, and it was strictly for game purposes. She was able to position herself, Maddie, and Will to be the swing vote in most of the jury votes, and even in some of the late pre-jury votes, which was definitely cool, which led to the risky choice of keeping Kayla over Alejandra and reuniting with her old allies in Dela. I think she would prove more of her skills if she was on another season, and that is why she is higher than I would have otherwise put her, despite my issues with her edit and some of her gameplay. At 12th is Dimitri from BB Can 5. He was very close to being a first boot, but luckily put in the work beforehand with certain relationships that would cause him to stay when Bruno and Kevin pulled off their last minute stunt. He did end up in the group of six, but I mainly think that happened only because he became the second HOH and people needed to kiss his butt. In general, he mainly was guided by Aika and kind of went along with what she wanted, but he would make their approach more stable and simplistic, as Aika tended to overcomplicate things and would change her mind a lot, but he didn't build strong relationships with other people in his alliance, with the exception of Cindy. After the double, his target grew a lot in the game, where he had to win competitions in order for him to stay in the house, and while it's great that he's one of the best competitors in BB history, and went against the GOAT competitor in Kevin, he was not able to convince people to keep him in the house with his social skills. Until the final five, where Karen kept him over Dylan on the block. It was impressive that he and Aika were able to survive, despite being nominated together twice. I think he has a solid enough social game, though there are some holes in his social game where people don't feel too close to him. A growing strategic game, and is a great competitor, so he is well-rounded, and I think he would be a little more cutthroat without Aika being there if he was on another season or in another situation on his own. At 11th is Kiefer from... BB Can 9. With BB Can 9 being known to have one of the weaker casts strategically, I was shocked with me placing Kiefer this high on the list. While he was with the Sunsetters for the entire season, he did have relationships with people who were not on his side, but he didn't come off as a floater like Tina did, so he was able to manage that role really well. I do think he was one of the better strategic forces in the season, which doesn't say much at all, and he had no choice to be such after Latoya left and Tina deflected, and when he had his mind made up, he stuck to it. He was the one who got Victoria to admit that she was a secret HOH, had her not target his allies, and he won the HOHs that dismantled the other side of the house, while keeping Tina and Tara as parachutes, where he had an alliance with them as well. His huge fault is that he is very cocky and likes to break about the game that he's had, which he was doing from very early on in the season, so it shouldn't have been a shock when his allies turned on him. And while it was kind of impressive that he convinced them to keep him after they nominated him, it's still three of the more scatterbrained people in Big Brother history, so it's not as big a video. 
He is good at competitions, is good socially and solid strategically, though I can see him being inconsistent if he was on other seasons, since he isn't an immediate threat like the others, but his cockiness could rub people the wrong way, and it wouldn't be shocking to me if his gameplay could only work in a season like BB Can 9. At 10th, and someone who just snuck onto there, and the final person in the subgroup is Adam from BB Can 7. My opinion on him as a player did go down after rewatching his season, but I was expecting him to be lower ranked in the good tier. But with everything said and done, barely making the top 10 is a good spot for him. He did enter the season with a preset strategy of replicating the Brigade Alliance, and he did that well, even before becoming the first HOH of the season. It worked out for him, especially because two other men in the Alliance were the best players in the house, so it cost him to be relatively safe, where that might not have been the case if the Alliance didn't exist. I mention that because a lot of people who weren't in the Alliance were actively targeting him, thought he was unlikable, angry, cocky, and somewhat sexist, which was individual from Samantha. He was able to bond with Samantha, Chelsea, and Kara, which showed that he could work with women and people who weren't like him, and they were genuinely looking out for him more than his own alliance was, but he was so ton of vision about going to the end with three men, and that ton of vision -ness is a worrying trait if you are on other seasons. Throughout the season, he got very emotional and confrontational at times, but then it turned into people seeing that he had a huge heart, and his social game genuinely did turn around, where people wanted to work with him, wanted him to win, and enjoyed his company a lot more in the second half of the season. I think he is great competitively, one of the best, became a good social player, and is relatively solid strategically, and he does have the potential to be more wide-ranging pertaining his strategy, since he had many different sides, but he didn't actively use to its advantage, but being ton of vision and being very emotional and volatile at times is why he barely made it at 10th. So the final sub-tier in the good tier are people who are barely missing out on greatness, and... The first person in this tier at ninth is someone who was in the great tier, but they got moved down. And that person is Netta from BB Can 2 and 5. Based on her gameplay in this season, Netta is definitely one of the best. She came in the game knowing that her best bet was to lay under the radar and to come off as non-threatening while solidly building relationships with people while not getting personal. She did a very good job at that, though her main allies in some of the women were extremely fishy and was a sinking ship. Luckily for her, Canada's HOH came in and it put her in the position for a big dog to go, where she admitted that she wouldn't have made the move herself that week without it, and it told her who was liked and disliked by Canada, where I do think it helped her form the sloppy seconds. She utilized her HOH well in getting out Kenny and to make sure that there is no other side, and was great at neutralizing people before they became a problem in the future, like Arlie and Allison, and convincing the goblins to boot him with a lot of hard work. Netta knew when to throw competitions and when to win competitions, which is an important skill, and always thought things through and thought ahead, more than the others. While she isn't the greatest socially, I do think she is solid in this retrospect, and knew how to be cutthroat while not coming off as malicious to the house guests, which is why she became a threat to win with a repeatable... Her journey is all over the place this season. Of course, Netta getting safety until Jory after the first week changed her gameplay and trajectory, though she admitted before the season that she was planning on playing card and like a bitch anyways. She found herself in the Veterans Alliance, and then the Alliance of Six, which included Aika, the BB Can 3 people, and Dimitri, who ran the first half of the season. It caused her to want to compete more, where she won HOH and took out Cassandra, which her allies appreciated. But I also think that she suffered like Danielle in BB13 did, out of boredom due to being safe for so long. Her social flaws became a lot more apparent here, where she doesn't bond with people not in her alliance and actively pisses people off in her own alliance. It all led to her being targeted as soon as her immunity finished, but there was also audience interference, and Netta did show that she was still a skilled player. I do think she would do better or close enough to her original appearance if she were to return, since a lot of the hype of her as a player and reputation-wise in general has gone down since it is so distant, and she still has strategic and competitive drive and juice. And while her social game is her weakest, I don't think it's really bad per se, just not very good. Especially compared to the others that are this high on this tier list. 
At 8 is Mitch from BB Can 4. Obviously, one of the reasons why he's this high is obviously due to being twist screwed with the fake double eviction and them having access to the live feeds to see him talking to everyone. Without that, Mitch definitely leaves much later in the season, especially since he won the battle with the Maddie vote and had most of the house against the brothers, Cassandra and Mitch. He was in the middle group that controlled things for the first half of the season, but also had very good relationships with the trio during this time as well, though he helped pitch for the Kelsey to get booted so he could have more control with Rao and Jared, which ends up happening. Even when he was on the block, he came up with everything he can to get people against the trio and to stay in the house, and it ended up being a close vote anyways. He definitely has a much longer run on the season without this, and does well on most seasons in general. At 7th is Tim from BB Can 4. The way Tim played the game was very interesting, especially since he not only played, but won BB Australia a few years before doing this season. He was lucky to come in at the second week and got immunity then as well, but he played dumb and had people explaining the game to him and all the dynamics in the house that was happening. He was able to blend in with the middle group immediately and really started to play the game and pick up on it, which is a strong trait as well. When he was HOH, he decided to do Australian nominations, where everyone had to nominate based on gummy bears, which caused him to know more about the dynamics of the house, how people played, and he can take the blame off himself for the nominations. He was getting outplayed by the end of his HOH reign, and benefited from Kelsey returning to boot Mitchell, even though he didn't realize it. He knew when to kiss up to people, make people feel comfortable, and to tell them what they want and or need to hear. At the same time, he is definitely a bit too reckless, didn't care to study for the endgame competitions, didn't understand certain metas of Big Brother North America, and can get easily frustrated where he quits things and rewrites narratives afterwards. And the final person in the sub tier and tier overall at 6 is John from BB Can 2. He is someone who knew next to nothing about Big Brother and ended up completely picking up on how to play the game, which is an important skill set, though he was heavily guided by Netta in this element, hence why he isn't as high as some of the others with this similar skill set. He was able to get in good with the men of the first five alliance, even if he couldn't stand Andrew, and was able to make early bonds with people not in that structure as well, though he really wanted to work with Kenny, but was rejected. It did seem like he was going to be the next target before Canada's HOH, and while he did win the veto the next week, he benefited from the change in dynamics that Canada's HOH provided him, where the others wouldn't have targeted the first five without it. The sloppy seconds was created, which was very important for his game, and he was in the middle of that structure. He was tricked into targeting Arlie a bit too soon, but he was able to win competitions for the rest of the season, causing him to never be on the block during eviction, and was smart enough to cut Netta at the end. In general, I think he has the natural skills to always do well, but I don't think he was a great like the ones above him. So now we're at the final tier of this tier ranking, which is the great tier, and it is rare for anyone to make it on this tier since these are the people who I think are the best of the best and are damn near flawless and are masterminds and just kick ass and take no names and they will most likely always be successful, which is why they are here and no one can top them. So there are no sub tiers here and the first person in this tier at fifth is Johnny from BB Can 6. I already talked about him in the last video, so I'm just going to copy and paste what I stated about him there and put it here. And at first is undoubtedly Johnny from BB Can 6. It isn't a shocker that he ended up being number one, as he controlled a lot of the things that happened in the game and controlled things a lot sooner than the edit showed. He was the main reason why Jesse ended up going, and it was the start of him targeting his own red room, and was the only one from that room to have a lot of good relationships with people in the right room, which is why he was better positioned than the others. He was able to freak out enough in the double to get Olivia to not target Mary, though he kind of lets this relationship go as the season went on, and was able to convince people to keep him when he was on the block against Ryan, and having them think it's their idea. He is able to get out of so many sticky situations and is able to manipulate things his way while being very good in competitions. His main issue was being too blinded by Dela, and it caused him to lose flexibility in this last week in the house. At 4th is Emmett from BB Can 1. 
With this recent rewatch and making BB Can 1 compilation videos as I'm recording this, I do see a few more of Emmett's flaws, and I think the main one is that he k kind of lacks empathy. I don't think he's a completely cold guy, as he would have done a lot worse in the season, but it has me thinking that he wouldn't do as well in an environment that is more diverse in age or other demographics, compared to how things were in BB Can 1. At the same time, he is still one of the best players in Big Brother overall. He picked up on the game extremely quickly, despite not knowing anything about Big Brother, being nominated and remaining on the block during the first night of the season throughout the first week. He mentioned that he is a great listener, lets people talk about themselves, and doesn't give away too much information. We saw him get into the Quattro Alliance and form good relationships with many of the others in the house while being the sniper in the side in a lot of the early boots, like Aniel, Liza, and a few others. Once Tom became a liability and knowing that he was stirred with the shield, he pivoted into making Jillian his number one and forming the East Coast Alliance with Andrew and later Tala, which ended up dominating the season, or the second half of the season, where they won most of the remaining competitions, but he didn't need to win those competitions since most people in the house weren't targeting him anyways. At the same time, because the jury were so bitter against Jillian, they didn't want to reward him anything unless he was beside her, but he always thought several steps ahead and his game still holds up well a decade later. At third is Anthony from BB Can 7. In a lot of ways, he does remind me of Emmett, which might have been why Emmett shaded him immediately after BB Can 7 ended, as they both knew nothing about the show before joining it, picking up on the game extremely quickly, and was able to mastermind most of the moves throughout the season. He literally gave people speeches for the nomination, veto ceremony, and eviction speeches, and they would end up doing the speeches, even though it did nothing but help Anthony's game. He was the pushing force to get Mackie out of the house in the second week, as Dane was still relatively unsure for a while, was the main person who turned the tides against Chelsea, and so much more in the first half of the season, where it was all ignored by the edit. He was able to keep a low profile, despite being the largest man in the house, was able to missed people into doing whatever he wanted them to do, and built good relationships with people who weren't in his alliance. He went the entire season not being nominated, and had to be twist screwed for things to not go his way during Mark's HOH, who he convinced to do what he wanted, while keeping the pretty boys in line. I do think his lack of fandom definitely hurt him with what the jury wanted from their winner in the season, and he definitely can get a bit too arrogant at times, but those easy mistakes could be fixed, or those are mistakes that could easily be fixed, and despite his reputation, I think his lack of cop wins benefits him in many future scenarios, where it doesn't make him come off as threatening as some of the others who will like him, but are also comp beasts. It will be interesting to see how Big Brother Canada 12 will affect his overall ranking and skill set, since he could likely go lower as most returnees do. Or he could be so great where he either maintains his third place position or potentially become number one based on how the season finishes and how the rest of his journey goes. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. At second is Kevin from BB Can 10. Out of the people who made it in this tier, it's clear that he played differently to almost all of them, which makes this tier interesting in comparison since he's such a huge outlier. He was on the out in the beginning and was on the block the first week, and his name was thrown out as a pawn star for the first few weeks, but he was able to get out of it. He focused on laying low and building relationships throughout the first few weeks of the season, so when he eventually did make a coup, he would have the numbers and relationships to do so. We saw this in week 5 where he gathered the numbers to boot Tanisha, and then the other side of the house completely dismantled, and despite booting Jess over Gino, he was able to convince Marty to break his deal with Herman to send him home the next week. He didn't need a twist to do this, unlike John and Netta, which is why he is higher than them. After that point, Kevin and Helena just took over the game, and he didn't need to win competitions to do that, and while it became clear that he was cutting people, especially Gino, the house wasn't better against him, since he had a much better social game than Helena. He was able to have Josh piss off his allies during the double, and had him keep him in their final four over Helena. I think Kevin has all the skills to do well in Big Brother, except for the competitions, which is the component that isn't the strongest, like strategic and social ability, and the ability to pivot and learn from your mistakes. But he would be in danger more often than the number one in other seasons, hence him only being here. And at first place is Dane from BB Can 7. Such a predictable number one, but it's an easy and most sensical one, unless a bunch of the upper tier people return, which seems very unlikely, 
and or someone usurps him from future seasons. His intention was to come into the game and make a solid alliance. It just so happened that he was approached to be in the Pretty Boys and went by that, where he and Adam won the first two HOHs. So it wasn't his intention to only work with guys, unlike Adam. Half of the house should have been pissed off at him for blindsiding them with booting Mackie, but no one was upset at him whatsoever. Chelsea was the only one at the time to completely see through him, and she ended up going home immediately, where the same thing ended up happening to Samantha shortly afterwards. It was always Anthony and Adam going at one another in the alliance, and everyone kind of just being annoyed at Mark. So Dane was always the one who had the best relationships in the alliance, and his side pieces in Estefania and Damien were the last two ones remaining. He knows when to play dumb, he knows when to make the cutthroat choices, he's great at competitions, he knows what the jury wants, and knows how to use his social skills to benefit him. In general, I just think he's the most well-rounded out of the BB Can players, especially after he made it through the final five, where he definitely should have been the boot, and would be in the least danger in most seasons. And that concludes my ranking of the Big Brother Canada players so far, and that was a long one. It literally took me over a week to just put together the list, though I had not put together the list, but to make this video. But the list I had from months, and I did some variations, I did some edits, I added some additional commentary, and wow. I cannot believe this video is almost three hours. I really, really, really appreciate everyone for following me on this journey throughout the last year regarding Big Brother Canada. And I know I'm going to rank the Big Brother US players sometime in the middle to later on in this year. And that's going to be even twice as long or over twice as long because there's a lot more seasons. And I'm so not looking forward to doing that since it's going to take forever. And I can only imagine the amount of hours that it is. So I'm going to finish talking about the jury portions and the endgame portions of the Big Brother Canada seasons. And then after that, I will finally rank the seasons, which shall be a longer video. I definitely have some other videos in mind, like... I'm working on the Sexuality in Big Brother video, or videos, actually. I definitely have to do the player tier rankings for the first season of the Total Drama reboot, and then get to the second season of the reboot. And at some point, I'll do the BB20 compilation videos, and I have some other non-Big Brother related videos as well. And I'm also thinking about covering some non-Big Brother reality shows. So that's going to be something that I'm going back and forth on. But yeah, there's definitely a lot to look forward to. And I really appreciate the support. Obviously, I am going to review or post a video of Big Brother Canada 12 when the season ends. And then I'll do the player tier rankings for that soon after as well. And I'm definitely really glad that this project is over and I can kind of just relax. Thank you all for supporting and you can watch all my other playlists. You can like, you can subscribe, you can follow me on my social media or on my Twitter at Lala underscore Annie if you want to see my further commentary on just things in general. And yeah, have a good one.